And we are live. Hey everybody, this is Roberto Blake helping you create something awesome today. Welcome back to the live stream. Today we're gonna excuse me. Today we're gonna be talking about brand deal sponsorship. This is monetization Monday. So basically, we're gonna be talking about how you make money as a content creator. And that is going to be what we're going to be focused on. And specifically, we're going to help a lot of you with brand deals and sponsorships. So please go ahead and get in your questions regarding that because we have a jam-packed show for you. Speaking of sponsors, I want to thank our sponsors for today's show, which are StreamYard, which is how we're streaming live right now on YouTube Live, uh, Twitch.com, X.com, formerly Twitter, uh, we are streaming to kick.com and we are streaming to LinkedIn Live and to Facebook Live all at the same time. So I think we're in seven different platforms all at once right now. We're in about six or seven platforms all at once right now. I'm eventually going to figure out um, doing Instagram Live at the same time too. So really happy about that. Thank you to our friends at StreamYard. Also, we're going to be doing clips for you across all the other social media platforms and eventually for YouTube shorts um, on my highlight channel, you can put this clip, which lets us repurpose our live stream, cut it down to something reasonable, and we can actually add animated captions, do all the things. So thank you to our friends over at Opus Clip for sponsoring this. It's a really good thing that I'm doing the sponsor plugs right now because we're talking about sponsorship and brand deals. Show you that I practice and they're helping make all this happen, including our good friends over at Kajabi, where I have my private membership website, awesomecreatoracademy.com. You can join the pro group for Awesome Creator Academy. You could also build your own membership website, or you can do courses if you're an educator, cohorts, community, all things with friends at Kajabi, the best all-in-one platform for building your online business. So thank you to all of our wonderful sponsors. By the way, good news for y'all, you're with somebody who knows how to do sponsorship, somebody who has consistently be doing, um, been doing $100,000 a year plus in sponsorships by having long-term brand relationships. And of course, you can see I practice what I preach. So what are you going to uh, get from me today? Today, you're going to get from me um, answers to any of your questions. We're going to talk about brand deals, sponsorship, so you know what the difference is. We're going to talk about building your media kit. I'm going to show you my media kit, how I built my pricing and packages for my media kit. So you're going to get full transparency kind of um, from that, including numbers people don't show in terms of pricing. Can I tell you what each individual sponsor paid? No, but I can show you the packages that I build and price and negotiate with my sponsors. And I can tell you a lot about the different pricing levers to why those are starting positions, not necessarily ending positions. And also how you can approach sponsors, how you negotiate, how you do all those things. Um, I also have built some resources around sponsorship um, that I'm gonna add to the description here because I have some things that I've built out that you can take advantage of. Uh, we have a lot of tools over at awesomecreatoracademy.com, including we have the brand deals starter kit. And so that could be helpful to quite a few of you um, who are looking for something. It's not quite a course, but it has things that might be better than a course for you, including um, one, downloadable and customizable media kits. So we have three of those in the brand deal starter kit with more to come. We have, I think, 12 email swipe files for reaching out to brands. And we have um, some other information and resources and we're adding things including our complete ugc guide for ugc content which we're also going to talk about in today's live stream we're going to talk about user generated content and how for especially those of you who are small creators small influencers and so on and so forth but what you do have is good production values good personality a good reputation you may not have the reach but you have everything else you could work directly for brands on their social media platform as what's called a ugc creator user-generated content. So it'll be a user-generated content creator, UGC. And we're going to teach you how you can do that. And then how, if you're working on other brands content for their social media, because you have good production, good editing, good um, etiquette, all those things, how it can benefit you and how you can make livable money. And for a lot of you, that will be your first taste of how you're going to start potentially. 
becoming a full-time content creator. So we're going to talk about the brand deals and long-term sponsorships. We're going to talk about UGC, and then we're also going to talk about management and working with um, agencies, talent managers, potential companies, whether you should do that exclusively, how that's different from MCNs, multi-channel networks, and why you should never work with a multi-channel network, never work with an MCN. So we're going to talk about all of that here for the next hour or two. Probably going to be closer to two hours. As long as my voice holds out, we'll do this for about maybe two hours, get you in and out, get you all home for dinner. And basically, you'll have um, the information that you need, or at least a good starting point. And of course, throughout this, we'll do Q&A. I will try to answer as many of your questions as I possibly can. Um, and yes, there I will have sponsor plugs throughout. And I will also uh, be letting you know that, yeah, you can either buy some of my products to help you with this, or you can work with me directly. I've worked with a lot of content creators. We do a lot of this in the Awesome Creator Academy Pro Group as well. And in the pro group, I um, train on and I teach this. And also because people can show up twice a week, um, I can help them with their brand deals and talk to them directly about their own situation because we do office hours twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, which is why my live streaming schedule is now Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So um, we'll see how long my voice lasts doing all this, you know. We'll, we'll see if I still have a voice when it's all said and done. If you're wondering where the audiobook is, where my audiobook is, that's why. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's what we're going to work on. I'm going to answer your questions. Of course, um, Super Chats uh, will get um, priority, and uh, that's how we're doing things. All right. So, <clears throat> going to do that. I've linked... Um, the brand deal starter kit in the description, but I'll go ahead and I'll paste that to the chat. We'll start answering your questions while I queue up. We'll start answering your questions if you have any in the chat first. Please put a Q. If you're in the live chat, put a Q in front of your question. If you're watching the replay, just drop a comment and I'll try to answer the first 100 comments on the video as usual. As usual, I try to always answer the first 100 comments on all of my videos. If you guys know, even the live stream replays, and we will get timestamps for you for all of this later. So there'll be timestamps for the replay. But if you go ahead and drop your questions with a queue, I can answer your questions and we'll do that while I grab my media kit and make sure my media kit is here so we can review that. So um, let's try and start with some of your questions and then we'll get going. So let's go to the chat. I'm also going to star these questions. The super chats will automatically be starred so I can revisit them. Um, <clears throat> but I'm going to also try to star the questions so that I can write them down later because uh, I might make a video response to some of these questions. I also might cut them up for shorts. So Kathleen Dautry, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, says, question, I'm having some trouble creating my portfolio. What would you say is the easiest way to get this done? Create it myself somehow or set up someone do it for me? So when you say portfolio, do you mean a portfolio of your work um, as an editor or do you mean a media kit as a content creator seeking sponsorship and brand deals? Because if you're uh, trying to do a media kit, what I'm going to do is I'm going to download my PDF again instead of... Um, uh, instead of um, sharing the screen for my media kit, I'm going to download it as a presentation and share it with you here. So just give me a minute to redo that. Um, yep, save to desktop. Because, yeah, if you're doing a media kit, um, the thing is I am very good at designing media kits, but I have a background in graphic design that lets me do that. Um, uh, size limit is 50. Okay. Yeah. I have to resize this file real quick. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to resize this file so that I can up, uh, show you here, um, in StreamYard because it'll be easier if I can present this as a PDF instead of screen sharing, but okay. So should you create it yourself somehow or have someone design it for you? Number one, you can get media kit templates in my brand deal starter kit. I just linked that in the chat. It's also in the description of this video. If you refresh, um, it should be in the description now. So I do have that and you can use Photoshop or you can use Adobe Express, which is free and still opens Photoshop files and then have a fully customizable, well-designed media kit. However, you could also try 
to, if you look at my media kit, you could try to make it yourself in Canva if you have at least a little bit of design skill. Now, some of that, that might not feel like your cup of tea either. So failing that, you can hire someone in Upwork or Fiverr if you give them the information that is needed by using mine as an example once I show you mine on the screen, which is why you definitely want to stay tuned for that. Once you see my media kit on the screen, in theory, you could use it as an example. You shouldn't copy it verbatim because what applies to me will not apply to all of you. So it needs to be with a grain of salt. And there's things you probably should have in your media kit that I don't need to uh, just because we're in different positions. And <clears throat> what I would tell you about that is that um, you could use it as an example. Tell someone in Upwork and Fiverr that you want similar layout or similar things or to have this many pages, that many pages, and it needs to include this or include that. You could do all of that. And then you could have somebody in Upwork or Fiverr make a media kit for you. Or you could try, going off of my example, to do it yourself. So it's an either or proposition. Um, what will work out best is if you have design skills, then maybe this works out. Um, if you don't have design skills, this could be frustrating and this could be time consuming. So it may not be the best thing to do depending on your skill set. So that's where I would say it comes in. For most of you, the answer is to use a template like the ones I sell or to hire someone because that's a time management thing in terms of, okay, I don't have this skill set. It's not the thing I'm best in the world at. It might take up time I should be using to make money, make videos, get better at something I'm actually good at. This is why I say that the skills that are best to build to be a content creator, one of them is graphic design, another one is photography, another one is video editing, another one is marketing and social media, another one is sales and negotiation, especially for the brand deals. Like I have a whole video I'm about to do about the um, skills every content creator needs. Um, so, um, and we're going to go over the media kit stuff in a bit, but I'm just going to show you guys very quickly um, what my media kit looks like right now. So this is my 2024 media kit, big upgrade from my 2019, 2020 media kit. So what I do at the beginning um, says who I am, has a reference to my website so people can learn more about me, but it also immediately in my case <clears throat> displays social proof. Immediately you see me with a silver play button with my name on it, not Photoshopped, real deal. And so I have that YouTube play button. So, you know, right off the bat, if you had no other familiarity with me, or you're walking this up to, if you're a um, person working at an ad agency or at a PR firm or with the brand, and you're taking this to your boss and your boss has no idea who I am. They see on the deck that they're dealing with a creator that has at least 100,000 subscribers or more. So that is social proof. So even the cover of my deck, my media kit, leads with my social proof because it's about the fact that someone at this brand may not know me. Or if I was referred by somebody, they, they, they may not know me. Or if we are, um, what do you call it? <clears throat> What's the phrase I'm looking for? So again, there could be any number of reasons why someone wouldn't be familiar with me. There could be any number of reasons why someone wouldn't be familiar with me. And um, I would say that, um, you know, <laughs> like I would say that the thing about that is you want to lead sometimes with that social proof to establish credibility. So whatever social proof you have, you may not have a silver play button, but if you have some credibility or social proof or you physically do something or there is a physical embodiment of your profession, your skill set, your expertise, you want to lead with that in some way. So I do it on the cover. So then, um, and we will go more into depth with this, um, but I'm just going to give you guys a quick overview of my media kit just so we get to some of the good stuff that you can't get anywhere else. And no one shows off their media kit or their prices. So then I go into my accolades so that they know, okay, he's the real deal. Me, I lead with something none of you probably will, which is some of the things that speak to the fact that I can convert numbers for uh, people because if I prove to them that I can make money, then they realize I can convert and my audience has buying power. So here I demonstrate things that are about my reputation, my revenue generation, a little bit of what my potential reach when audience can be. And um, then what I really dive into <clears throat> is the opportunities to work with me. 
So these are different offerings, and this helps me customize a package to the needs of the brand, but also makes them think about things they may not have thought of before. <clears throat> and this lets me customize higher end packages, more deliverables, and increase my rates. A lot of you only think about dedicated videos, integrations, shout outs, things like that. Most of you are not thinking about live stream integrations or podcast integrations. A lot of you haven't figured out that even if you're an entertainer, you should start a podcast potentially on a separate channel to establish another audience, another brand, and have bundled pricing because now you can bulk sell as an entertainer and a thought leader who has a podcast. And then you can leverage using a podcast to build a network so that when you aren't as entertaining to a young audience, you still can age up and have them age into your podcast. You can be known as a personality. You can build a deeper network. People can refer you for new opportunities. So that's why entertainers should bridge the gap so they, when they age out, they should have a podcast. And the podcast should be about something different than what they're known for. If you're a gamer, don't make a gaming podcast. Have a more general podcast that could be about entertainment or comedy. Either have a comedy podcast so you can um, have something outside of gaming and not be narrow and then have a general audience and be able to go direct to consumer in your brand deals or your own products. So if you're a gamer or you cover anime, get out of your head that you're going to make an anime or gaming podcast, make an entertainment based, pop culture based or comedy based podcast. So you have more range. People do not consider range when they are expanding their brand and their potential. So that gives you opportunities. If you are a thought leader educator, you can do webinars, you can do physical keynotes in person, sponsored LinkedIn content. <clears throat> you still can do amplification for a brand in Twitter. And what that comes down to is things like retweeting their stuff and amplifying them, recommending them, doing all kinds of things. If you're a thought leader, you should be building a newsletter. You should be trying to get that newsletter to at least be 10,000 subscribers and really push for sponsorships for the newsletter then. If you get the 30, 50,000 subscribers, your newsletter could build a full-time income by itself. If you have 30, 50,000 subscribers, you can have a $100,000 a year newsletter. Not kidding. So for a lot of you, this is gold right here in terms of, oh, these are all the things I could offer. These are all the opportunities. This would be the thing, the screenshot. These are like all the opportunities. Wow. Okay. So then I go into audience alignment so that you know who um, you would be targeting if you work with me. So here's who my audience is and here are the things that they care about. And here's what I do for them. So then this determines whether we're aligned. This determines whether we're aligned. You might also notice something in my uh, media kit. I'm using my photography background to my advantage. So what I do is I either use a remote and do my own photography with a remote setup in my basement, and then I cut myself out of the backgrounds for uh, this. And then the other thing I do is if I don't do that, I have such good camera gear that I just do art direction and tell my siblings how I want my shots. And then one of my siblings, because we all have an art background and a creative background, they all can do photography. I did all the lighting. I put in a lot of the camera settings and they know how to shoot and I can art direct them. So then what do I do for else? Uh, credibility. I use my other previous brand partners as credibility. What you could do if you wanted to, to add to this, I just use the names. Some people use the logos. I want to use the names because I just have so many of them. And so <clears throat> this is um, you know, something that I do as part of credibility. Uh, so you want that if you have done previous brand partnerships. If you haven't done previous brand partnerships, you want to at least have an affiliate marketing case study that shows you can sell other people's stuff. I did one case study at least that shows clicks, installs, lifetime purchases, and revenue generated um, through a partnership with TubeBuddy. So um, this then tells any brand that is at a certain price point or is that a software as a service brand what I can do for them. Um, reach on platforms. This is the reach part. I already did reputation by showing my reputation here. Um, proof of ability to generate revenue. If you don't have a case study like this that is based on previous partnerships, you can use affiliate marketing in place of this. You can also use um, 
Another case study could be something where you do something about your own product sales. If you have impressive product sales, merchandise, anything like that. So that could be valuable. So you want to do that here. Um, I have the closest reasonable uh, current numbers for my platforms. And I use that. So podcast, 100K downloads on the podcast across 82 episodes. So that's pretty decent. Um, my subscribers, uh, my Twitter followers, which is now 95K, I think, or pretty close. I'll be to 100K soon. Then I'll update that. Instagram, 24K. LinkedIn, 12K. Facebook, 10K. So um, that's what I do. Then I went to audience demographic data. Again, using custom photography here is to my advantage. It makes me stand out. So they care a lot about the demographics. They care about the location. They care about all those things. Um, then I use more analytics. For me, I leverage my email list uh, because these numbers are very high, impressive for the industry. So I use those. I use my uh, trust pilot reviews. This is a little dated because I now have 70 of those. So that just speaks more to credibility again, plus traffic opportunity, my website traffic. There might be crossover there. It also shows, I show these numbers also because it shows I can generate leads. If I can generate leads for myself, I can generate leads for a brand. So these are things that um, I, I care about. Uh, and these are things a brand would care about because it's like, okay, if he can generate leads and trust and reviews for his own thing, he can get us similar results if he can get that for himself. So that's something you need to think about. They do care about traffic a lot. Um, content formats. This is more about alignment and about where they can advertise. So this is about what they can advertise on. Explainer videos, tutorial videos, complete guides. Complete guides are very appealing to software companies. So it's there. Same thing for tutorials, very appealing to software companies. Software companies have a lot of um, opportunity, have good margins. They do sponsorship, but I can double dip with affiliate. So opportunity there. Podcast. So they love all this stuff. So I put that there. For you guys, you might be able to talk about short form. If you specialize in short form, you might be able to talk about, oh, you do short form for TikTok, Instagram, YouTube shorts. That might be the play you use. Obviously, I play to my strengths with long form. So that's uh, my strengths. So then I use another credibility piece here because I'm a published author, but I also position myself with, hey, I influence influencers. If you're trying to do that, then I'm the guy to work with. So it's again, it's another positioning play. You might have a different positioning play. Um, then I go into partner packages. So with uh, with me, I, I positioned and I use a tactic called price anchoring. I use a tactic called price anchoring. My most popular package is my silver package. And sometimes we negotiate a variation of that. Um, and so sometimes it can be something that looks closer to a bronze package, but then we negotiate some lesser deliverables and what's exact in that and how much I'm going to do. And then that could still be a six month package. I have, a, I have another um, brand sponsor. I have a fourth brand sponsor that's actually doing a bronze package, a bronze package, but we removed category exclusivity and then we extended that relationship for six months instead of three. But at, um, a similar, or is it the same? No, it's a higher price point than that. It ended up being like something higher than 24K for the year. It ended up being higher than 24K for the year, but it's actually a six month deal and it's a little higher in price, but it's six months. So we have a fourth sponsor that I did with that. We have a fifth one I'm negotiating that on. So, um, you know, that's different. Some people want to do the um, six month at, uh, package for the silver, but there's other people who like, we want what's in the silver package, but can we extend that to 12 months? We'll do less of this, more of this, but can we do that for 12 months? And then I go, okay, fine, sure, not a problem. So these are all starting points and then you wanna um, negotiate on certain levers. So what's meant by category exclusivity means that, let's say it's StreamYard, for example, this just is an example. If it's StreamYard, it'd be, okay, then I'm not gonna work with StreamYard's competitors. That's what exclusivity means. So that means not working with like Riverside, for example, or Restream. So um, that or, or Stream um, Labs, for example, OBS Stream Labs. So I wouldn't be working with their competitor. And that, so that's an opportunity cost based on the opportunity cost of category exclusivity. Then you charge uh, more. 
Um, so that would be a thing. Um, WG Mojo, Justin more often teaches against using fixed price packages. He says every deal should be bespoke. What are the pros and cons? Glad you asked. Justin is great and he specializes in brand deals. He also worked on the agency side as well as being a creator, him and his wife, um, April, and they've done millions of dollars in um, partnerships. Not everything works for everybody. And the thing is, if I was more of a vlog, family channel, education channel, I might do more of that. My packages are bespoke. They are bespoke. But my pricing points in terms of what starts the conversation and where it uh, starts uh, means I use this to filter people who would otherwise waste my time. So that's why these exist. Because you may notice I don't have any details outside of length and category exclusivity length. There are no other details in my entire media kit about what's included in this. So my packages are bespoke. And then here it is, is like um, contact stuff. But it's like my packages are bespoke. All this says is that here is how much I can be worth and that less than this waste my time. Customization, everything is bespoke. It just says that these are my minimum requirements that says, do not waste my time. If you're not bringing at least this to the table, this is what starts a conversation and we can finesse this. And the thing is you might want much less than I need to offer. And then, yeah, you can get, you can get something. There's a way to get a lower price than this. If I'm doing very little work, there's way, there's infinite ways to where we can do something that requires me to do almost nothing. And yeah, I will do $2,000 and I will do very little work and we can work something out to where, oh, this literally is a day's worth of work. Yeah. Let's do $2,000. I work $2,000. It's one day of work, it's not even eight hours for the day, absolutely we can do a bespoke package on that if that's the deal. But again, this gets people to, to the conversation because again, I do not want to do volume. I want to do long-term relationship. That's the other thing that this says to people. This is why you, again, I tell you, don't copy my packages. I put mine out there and it's not for you to copy, but it's an inspiration as to what is possible for you. It is an inspiration for, now again, I will tell you that nobody's taken me up on the gold package this year yet, but there is a relationship with a silver package that can become, where we've talked about them going from silver to gold if it works out. So just keep those kind of things in mind. Now, what I will tell you is that my packages are bespoke. It is about customizing this to their needs. That's why there's no additional details. This is just a conversation starter and a way to say, brand, do not waste my time. I'm doing long-term relationships. I have several partners already that I'm very, very happy with, and I don't need to chase your dollars. If you're not gonna start the conversation here or give me some easy layup if it needs to be less dollars than this, but it's an easy layup. If that's not the case, then let's not waste each other's time because I'm only dealing with a handful of people throughout the year. I'm not chasing 20 brands to work with this year. I really only want to work for, with five or six, and I want to do it long term. I only want to work with five or six people long term. That's it. So you're either in the, one of these slots or you're not. Or if we're going to do a one-off deal, which I'm not really that much of a fan of doing the one-off deals, then come with this price or tell me how very little work I'm doing, or let's talk about UGC. And then that's a conversation. So I use this to just save me time, save me headaches, save me frustration, because I have long-term partners and I have exclusive categories for those partners. And it's a deal or no deal situation. Now, if you're a smaller content creator, this does not work exactly this way if you're a smaller content creator. This is a move that's a power move that you can do when you build up a reputation, when you built up leverage, when you are a market leader in your industry, when you are one of the only people they can go to for the thing that you do in the world. That's different. I have several things that put me in this position. Being a best-selling author is one of them. Being a known keynote speaker is one of them. My network is another. It's not even about my subscriber count or my views or my reach is largely more about my ability to generate leads and sales and that I can vouch. And so my reputation is leverage. I built that reputation for over a decade though. That doesn't work in a different position. It doesn't work and that's why I'm trying to teach you. It doesn't work in a different position. So you gotta know your position. This is all just to show you what a good media kit looks like and what is possible and what someone can be paid in this industry. And if you're getting more views than me, 
if you're getting more views than me, even if you're a smaller creator, it just gives you some inspiration as to what is on the table and what's possible. And most of you are probably charging half of what you could get. It also is to show you why you should think about long-term relationships and category exclusivity. So again, I love what Justin says, and I love that he offers a completely different perspective than me. He's also speaking to a broader category creator, and he knows that 80% of the people he's talking to are doing entertainment content. Me, I actually try to do something that's not talked about as much, which is the thought leader. Thought leaders and influencers are two different categories of creator. And the influencer is the entertainment person. The thought leader is the education authority person. Okay. So the um, influencer is more attention. The thought leader is more authority. So then we're pulling different levers when we're doing that and we're taking different approaches. I can tell you how to do either because I literally last year coached 50 different gamers so yes, I'm still with it. I'm still hip and happening. I know how entertainment content works, even though I don't specialize in doing it myself. I've gotten people to gold play buttons doing entertainment content. I've gotten people six-figure brand deals who do entertainment content. So I absolutely believe in what Justin's saying, but I also have a different perspective. And there are there's more than one way to do everything that we talk about. There's more than one way to do it. So um, that is something I just wanted you to be aware of. And... I wanted to show you guys my media kit for a couple of reasons. Design. Look at how I approach design. Look at how I used font consistency, colors, branding, and look and typography. Look at how I used photography and how it was customized throughout and how it puts me in a good position. But then also look and pay attention to the way I handled copy. Easy to use, scannable copy with the most important things, larger and in bold and with color contrast. Those things like really can help you. Um, I mean, this is one example. Another example of that positioning is again, scannable stuff. Oh, there's the formats he offers. Hey, here's those demographics and stats. Simple, easy to read case study, not overwhelming them. And, and then, oh, here's the brands he worked with. Easy, scannable information. One paragraph on who my audience is. Easy to scan information about uh, opportunities to work with me. So again, the reason that I approach this and I wanted to show you guys this is one, I do radical and extreme transparency. You guys even got to see what my rates are. Most people, you should not put your rates in your media kit anyway. Aside from being to spoke back, most of you shouldn't put rates in your media kit. And if you do, then don't make the media kit something people can download on a website where your competitors can see it. Then only email that to brands. That way your competitors don't find it and don't see it. Don't publish it to the internet. If you put your pricing in, if you put your pricing and your rate card in, don't publish it to the internet where your competitors can see it and undermine you. Email only directly to the brands in that case. Have the PDF. If you want to put your rates in it, then you only email it to the brands. <clears throat> so I would say that that is like an important distinction. Why do I make my numbers public? I make my numbers public for all of you. I also make my public's number my numbers public because remember, I don't have to live off my brand deals. It is 40% of my income right now. Brand deals is probably 40% of my income right now, but it's not what I have to use to live off of. It certainly helps. Certainly helps, especially with paying those wonderful taxes. When I have to pay $75,000 a year in taxes, oh boy, does a brand deal help. When I have to pay $75,000, $80,000 a year in taxes, boy, does a brand deal help out, okay? But- I publish my stuff for radical transparency so that more creators are willing to and able to see that they should charge more money and that they're probably underpriced because I think it's inspirational when someone's getting five times the views of me and then they see what my pricing is. They realize that views aren't everything and they realize maybe they could think of this differently because I can get you without you increasing views. There's ways for you to make money. UGC content, which we will talk about, is a big important part of that package and how you make more money because I make a lot of it because I do UGC content. You might be seeing my face on a lot of different brands, websites, and uh, on their marketing materials, on their ads. That's UGC. That's UGC. It's also NIL, name, image, likeness. That's a reputation play. That's not about reach. That's about reputation and about notoriety. Very different than reach. Very different. And that can be more of a thought leader play. Now, if you're a big enough influencer, a big enough entertainer, a big enough name, you can do that as well. And then that makes sense if the audience is aligned. 
So those things matter a lot. And that's why I transparently show it to you. And a lot of people don't, and they will not share their numbers. Numbers are the thing that nobody shares. You can go watch everybody's, oh, how to get brand deals and everything. You watch every blogger. You can watch every 20-year-old lifestyle, female lifestyle influencer. You can watch every uh, prankster and vlogger that says, oh, here's what brand deals. And they will never tell you what their rates are. They will never tell you what their packages are because they're worried about their competitors. I'm not worried about my competitors. My competitors are mostly friends of mine, and I don't mind them knowing what I charge. I don't care. I will tell them over dinner anyway. So I can be ra – radical transparency is on brand for me, but I'm also an educator. I'm a thought leader. Radical transparency works for me. No one who's an entertainer will tell you how the sausage gets made unless they are too big for you to compete with like Mr. Beast. So like – that's a real thing. And that's not to throw shade at anybody. That's no disrespect to entertainers. I'm telling you that as an entertainer, you shouldn't be radically transparent like me. Your competitors will take advantage of it, and they'll undercut you, underbid you, undermine you. I can be radically transparent because I'm not worried about it. And because I have a great relationship with my existing brand partners, and they have my back, so I don't worry about it. Um, so that's what I would, I would tell you. Um, gardening with Bear Brown ask a question. Thank you for this question. What would you do as a new content creator to monetize your channel? Or how did you go about this when you got started? Thanks. Okay. So when I got started, the world was very different. When I got started over a decade ago, I went full-time freelancer instead of, oh, quit your day job, become a YouTuber. That was not a thing back in 2012, 2013. That was not a thing. So I was a full-time freelancer. It gave me several advantages. One, time freedom. As a full-time freelancer, I get to decide when I wake up in the morning because I don't have to go to an office. So no commute, no office, full-time freelancer, right? So full-time freelancer, I can wake up when I want, I can work when I want, and I can charge what I want so I can make more money in 10 hours a week than I could in 40 hours a week or even in 40 hours in two weeks So as a full-time freelancer. For me, that meant I might get a project and it might be a $500, $600 logo design. That might take me 10 hours. The rest of you to make $500, $600, you might have had to work a full week of eight-hour shifts and work 40 hours to make the same amount of money. So, all right, boom, got a client, do a logo design. Okay, great. Now I still have all this available time. Oh, get another client. Oh, I got the client, but I have to wait on them for the deliverables, the text copy to build the website. The website's $1,000. Okay, we're making an eight-page website, $1,000, doing it them because they've got money, but they have no tech skill. They have no, they, no headaches, blah, blah, no design background. Okay, cool. So I would do all these things, right? Oh, write an article for $150 for this website. Write their copy. Okay, I got to do their copywriting. Okay, this is going to take me... They gave me all the bullet points. I have to do no research. I have to do copywriting. They just want me to make it coherent. Okay, cool, cool. 150 bucks. I know the subject matter. Okay, this is going to take me an hour. Fantastic. Took me an hour. Oh, they had revisions? 30 minutes. Oh, great, cool. Two hours, made 150 bucks. So that was my life as a freelancer, right? Oh, edit somebody else's video. Videos I was editing, simple stuff. It was literally cutting out dead air. And it's that these people were business owners. They had money and they didn't want to learn Premiere Pro. They didn't want to learn another skill. They're like, I got money. I ain't got time. I want to go play with my kids and I want to run my business. I do not want to loan Photoshop. I do not want to loan video editing. Fine. Okay, cool. I'll edit your video, 200 bucks. So for a company, not a YouTuber, a company. So it's like, oh, this is going to take me an hour or two, 200 bucks. Great. So that was what being a freelancer was like for me a decade ago, right? Because I can do, has that tie to being a YouTuber? Here's why. Making that money instead of working a nine to five job, 40 hours a week meant that I could make the money I needed to live off of for the month in 40 hours a month instead of 40 hours a week. So that freed up a lot of time to play with content creation and to figure it out. And it took me three years to get to 100,000 subscribers, but I had the time. And I was able to make daily videos and make 800 videos to get to 100,000 subscribers. And back then, AdSense didn't pay jack. And I was also in a multi-channel network that took half of my AdSense money. Multi-channel networks are a total scam. 50% of my AdSense money for years in that contract. A lot of people will tell you what, that they in the early days of YouTube when we were all small YouTubers, like when I had 1,400 subscribers and no big YouTubers warned me and I didn't know any better. That's also my villain origin story of why do I coach y'all because I got ripped off and I got 50% of my ad revenue for years gone 
because of multi-channel networks. Like, and big YouTubers used to advocate for multi-channel networks. They didn't warn us about it. And then later, they all are heroes for coming out and telling us and exposing multi-channel networks later. Yeah, it's really great to come in and be a hero later and expose the thing after, uh, say, yeah, I was a victim of this for you after the fact. But to be fair to them, we were all under NDAs. When you join a multi-channel network, you're also under an NDA. So it's like, so it's a crappy situation all around. So I'm not really blaming them, but like, I was like, okay, what if I just talk to content creators and I tell them the things I know? And what if most of it is for free, but if they want one-on-one -on -one time, I charge for my one-on-one -on -one time. So that's like my origin story of how I got into teaching content creators instead of just being one um, and doing tutorial and tech content and why I started teaching is because I didn't want what happened to me to keep happening. And now, thank God, multi-channel networks are almost extinct. My point is, by being a freelancer, by being a freelancer, I had all this time and then whatever extra money I made on content creation, I was able to invest that and have investment capital back into lights and microphones and cameras and software and all those things that would help me grow, right? And make better content. So I was able to do that. Um, the thing I didn't do, the smart thing would have been to also do manpower, hire an editor. And then I did have some experience and expertise, not in content creation, but in the skills of being a content creator because photography gave me the camera gear skills. So that's how I got started. The camera gear, I also would shoot photos and videos for weddings on the weekends. So my camera, when I'm not doing YouTube stuff, was using to being used to make me money with the camera gear. So a lot of you could start out by using all of the skills as a content creator, as a freelancer for other people, and then make money. The other thing you can do now that you can do back then is do UGC content with the same skills, same camera gear, do UGC content. Make social media content for companies Make social media content for companies on their website, on their social media profiles that looks really good or better than what they have. So you can do that plus freelancing. So you could do UGC plus freelancing now, and you would make money until being a content creator on your own platform pays off. So you would use skills instead of reach. You do skills instead of reach and skills build a reputation. So you use skill instead of reach, build a reputation on the quality of what you can make with your skill. So reputation, you leverage reputation to drive revenue instead of using reach to drive revenue, which is what influencers do because you're not a big influencer yet. So if you're a small influencer, small content creator, build your skills, production value, editing, photography, being good on camera, build a portfolio of work, a body of work that shows you have a reputation for doing good work, work above average of the people of your size then your reach doesn't matter because your reputation, your skills, reputation, the work you do, being easy to work with, not being problematic, those things, use that, okay? Because what you don't have the reach yet and you don't have proof of revenue yet, so you don't have that to leverage. Use your reputation slash skill set slash um, the ease of working with you as reputation. Keep your nose clean. Then you also use that to build relationships. So now you have relationships to leverage. OK, you go back to people over and over who you have a good reputation with and you have a relationship with. You keep getting hired. You keep making money. Now, if you can do that, you can get out of your nine to five job. If you can do that, you have time freedom. You now have extra money. You have investment capital. The smart thing to do with that investment capital besides buy a bunch of gear like I did is to buy someone else's manpower. I wish I'd hired an editor. I still haven't done that. I'm training my brother instead. And then he's going to be on payroll for the company. He's already on payroll for the company. He's going to work with me as an editor. That's going to free up my time. So manpower manpower if you have investment capital you use it to buy manpower and then you also gain experience and expertise or you use someone else's experience or expertise like hiring a mentor or a coach so that's the formula the formula is t-i-m-e which equals time time freedom investment capital my manpower and then experience and expertise so those four things give you an opportunity right so the way i monetized was i used my content because of what i was doing at the time to also be a portfolio my content was also a portfolio, a body of work. I used that body of work to get clients. I got clients and then that fed the money I would need to not only live, but money that could be used to invest into the channel. And so then that, and then also doing that work gave me more experience and gave me more expertise. The experience expertise also came from my previous background, doing marketing, doing sales, doing website design, learning SEO, doing graphic design, all skills I could use to make my own content better, but also skills I could use to make money by doing client work. And for all of you, you can use that and do client work 
as a freelancer and then UGC as a creator for other people, content for other people, aka brands on their platform and make your money. You do enough of those and you can quit your job. The other way you can monetize, by the way, that helps you get brand deals is affiliate marketing. I started with the Amazon Influencer Program back when it was called the Amazon Associates Program. And this is affiliate links. And you, you, too many of you listen to all this nonsense about, oh, affiliate marketing is a scam. Affiliate links is a scam. Anything could be a scam done by unethical people. But that usually is the minority of the established market because the thing is, as much as people think that it's disproportionately like scammers, it's the opposite. The scammers come into the market because it's legitimate market because affiliate marketing is just commission sales. And that's what no one tells you. Affiliate marketing is commission sales. The problem with Amazon though, is they only pay 2% to 8%. But if you go directly to manufacturers, manufacturers will give you a 10% to 20% commission on physical products like lights, camera gear, microphones. So uh, official websites like Aperture and Sweetwater and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of these brands for microphones, cameras, other hardware, computer electronics and components, they'll do anything from a 10% to a 20% commission, whereas the Amazon affiliate program is only a 2% to 8% commission. That's the difference. Amazon always wins, trust me. And we all know that one, right? So manufacturers, and this also applies to the makeup and beauty industry for um, you know those of you who are in that side versus tech is like, uh, and the big box retailers do affiliate marketing too. Target, Best Buy, and Walmart now all have affiliate programs directly on their website for commissions as well for people who qualify. So, and theirs I think is 10 or 15% usually. So affiliate marketing is mostly legitimate. There are a few people that there are things where there, I'm not saying there are no scams. I'm saying it's truly the minority of the market and it has to be because the thing is scammers only go to markets that typically already have established uh, legitimacy so they can sneak under the radar. That's the entire point. So, and it's also a proven market that has money. They go into proven markets that have money. So the thing is all you have to do to avoid the scams is to work with legitimate companies and you could start with big box retail. You could start with Amazon affiliate uh, program, but then also there's a different type of affiliate marketing. And this is where brand deals come in because if you prove yourself with affiliate marketing, you can go back to that same company if you do direct with the manufacturer and say, hey, I'm, I know I'm one of your top affiliates, or I know I make you guys a lot of money every month. What about doing a partnership with me since I proved I can sell? And what? And here's why I'm thinking for a partnership. And then that's how you start to negotiate a brand deal out of thin air um, is you've already proven you have value. Well, you can prove you have value. And instead of using reach because, oh, I get all these numbers, I go viral. No, prove you can sell. Prove you can make the company money by actually making the company money. And instead of working for free, get a commission. You make money, the company makes money. Think about it. Right now with your nine to five job, what if you got 10% of every dollar you ever made your company? The company you work at right now, wouldn't it be life-changing money if for every dollar you've ever made that company, you got 10% of that? You got 10 cents on the dollar? Like if you got that, how much would that change your life? If you got 10% of every dime you ever made your employer, how life-changing would that be? That's why affiliate marketing is just commission sales with no salary. That's the difference. It's commission sales with no salary. But for an influencer, for a content creator, for a thought leader, the thing is, it's like, hey, I'm going to recommend and promote things I like or that I use or they're part of my workflow anyway or a part of my lifestyle anyway. I might as well get paid for it. And I might as well never wear a company logo if I'm not going to make money on it. So it's either affiliates or it's sponsors because you ain't got no business wearing someone's logo or brand other than your own merchandise if that's the case. Aside from if it gives you status. You can wear a watch that's not sponsored because it gives you some status. You know, you can wear a sweater if it's comfortable because it's comfortable instead of status. But mostly you should just only promote things and have things in the videos and in the background of your videos if you make money off of them, which means affiliate links for all of them in every video or that company has to sponsor you. Why are you promoting a company for free? Why are you working for free? Why are you promoting someone for free? Why are you representing someone for free? Make money off of it because if someone wants what you have and wants to buy what you have, they should at least use your affiliate link so that you at least get 2%, 8%, 10% because you're promoting it. You're representing it. You're vouching for it. 
one way or another. So I started with the Amazon Influencer Program as one of my ways I monetized. I lived in North Carolina at the time. This is 10 years ago, so take it with a more than 10 years ago now. Take it with a grain of salt. With the Amazon uh, Influencer Program, at the time, because I was doing a lot of uh, stuff related to tech, hardware, camera gear, um, things of that nature, and hardware, and budget hardware, budget laptops, those things, I was making about $1,200, $1,500 a month. Now, the first month, I made $12. Second month, I made $500 because I figured out what I was doing. Within six months, I figured out how to make about $800 to $1,000, and then I normalized it to about um, somewhere between $1,200 and $1,500. You have to remember, living in North Carolina, the rent on a three-bedroom was $950 at the time. This is 10 years ago, so a grain of salt, but it was $950 for a three-bedroom house in North Carolina in not a bad neighborhood. That means the Amazon affiliate program was able to pay my rent and utilities. So it may not sound like life-changing money if you live in New York and California, but it makes a big difference. I also leveraged my category sales. I took my category sales from Amazon. I screenshotted them. And then I used that in my outreach emails to get my first paid brand deals. And for me, some of my early brand deals, not my very first ones, but my early paid brand deals um, in 2015, 2016 were Dell as a laptop company with the Dell XPS series laptop. Uh, and I showed that for graphic design and video editing. I didn't do a review. I did a showcase. I did a feature showcase. And then when the contract expired for those videos is when I did my 30-day review so I could do it while not under contract so I didn't have to do a paid review. And then I was able to use the affiliate commissions off of that. That was also helpful. And then another one I did was for HP computers with my HP 360 product feature and showcase video. And then later I put out a review when the contract was over. And so I also got to keep those laptops. And then those laptops I passed on to my younger siblings at the time who were students and needed good laptops because I was mostly editing on my Mac, um, iMac at the time. Um, so that that's an example of how I used the affiliate sales I did in the laptop category to facilitate those early brand deals. It also helped me facilitate a relationship where at the time, there was a company, uh, the company went out of business um, later, but it was a lens rental company. They, no, they, they, I don't know if they got out of business or if they merged with the other company. I think the other company bought them out. I think Borrow Lenses or Lens Rentals bought them out. And then the company ended because they got absorbed. They got acquired by the bigger company. I think that's how it went. But anyway, this company, this one company, um, one, they were already paying me to write articles. And then there was my affiliate sales on camera gear. So then they started... A relationship with me where they weren't sponsoring my content, but they were lending me gear I could review. And then that helped me get a reputation that then got me other opportunities. So you can leverage affiliate marketing to get brand deals and also network relationships so that you get early access to products. Early access to products gets you more views and more subscribers, and then it could also get you affiliate money. The affiliate money can help subsidize you early when AdSense isn't enough. In my case, AdSense was already not great, but then I had a multi-channel network taking 50% of my ad revenue. And I didn't lean hard into sponsors later until much later, but I used affiliate marketing as part of my sales pitch so that I could go off my revenue generation proof instead of my reach. And then as I built status, I was able to use my re uh, reputation. And then also I was able to use my relationships as I started networking. And so that's how you would do it. It's reach, reputation, revenue generation, relationships. Those are the four R's. Those are four levers you can pull. If you don't have all of the levers, you need to start with getting one or two of them as best as you can to start. And then hopefully it helps you feed the other ones. And so that's uh, powerful. And you sell on those things. You don't sell on one. Creators make the mistake of selling on reach. The goal so that you are pigeonholed and you should never sign contracts that say you have to get a minimum view floor. You should always try to build a way to have proof of revenue generation even if you're uh, an influencer that's an entertainer, you should figure it out. That could include your merch sales. It could include affiliate links. It could be any number of things. But it also, you should build a good reputation 
which is also skill. That's also being easy to work with and not having scandals. That helps a lot. And you should build networking relationships, but you should also prove the relationship you have with your audience and the loyalty your audience has. And that's not all in your reach. It can also be an engagement. It can be in other ways. It can be in um, public reviews. It can be any number of things. It all depends. So that's why in the early days to monetize, yes, it's ad revenue, but ad revenue is going to pay jack for most of you. So then for a lot of you, you could do affiliate marketing, but that leans more to you over there. You're a product reviewer, a tech channel, a camera channel, a beauty reviewer. Affiliate marketing does better there. But if you're in the business sphere or the tech sphere or the tutorial sphere or the uh, career sphere, then you can do what's called software as a service affiliate marketing. Software as a service affiliate marketing then also leads you to long-term brand deals with software companies. And as you know, my sponsors are almost all software companies. Hardware can work too, by the way. But the thing with software companies is the affiliate commissions on software companies are monthly recurring, monthly recurring revenue. MRR is what we call that, monthly recurring revenue. So that's people, when you make a sale, you're getting 20, 30, or 50% commissions on the customer you made for the lifetime of that customer's account. So a primary example is you all know that I worked with TubeBuddy as a sponsor and as an affiliate. And Right now, even with after the pandemic churn, I still make over $3,000, $3,500 a month alone from TubeBuddy with no additional work um, off of happy, satisfied customers staying with them because I have that affiliate relationship. So that's true passive income. The other good news is I can use those numbers for other software companies to want to work with me. So that's how um, that's very powerful, and that makes for more revenue streams. And so when you do software partnerships, you can do affiliate revenue, and you can get sponsorships. So now you can double dip, and it's perfectly legitimate. So that's why I like software affiliate marketing a lot. And this is why I said, if you want to avoid scams or anything like that, you just work with established real companies that sell physical products or software. And then you're good. Amazon being the first one, but then there's also direct to manufacture. You can go to direct manufacture and that'll be better commissions than Amazon. It can be harder sometimes to get those sales, but it, it's but you get a higher chunk of the sales. So it could be worth it because it could be a 5X difference or more because you get a 10, 20% on manufacturer, sometimes 15%, but Amazon is two to 8% commissions. But software is usually 20% monthly uh, recurring or 30% monthly recurring, could be even be 50% recurring or at least 30, 20, 30, 50% for the first 12 months, if not forever. If it's not forever, then it's usually for like 12 months. Some people do bounty commissions where it's like, oh, $20 a lead, $50 a lead, $100 a lead, right? So there are things that do bounty commissions. Amazon has a bounty commission for Audible, and it's like five bucks for free trials, 10 bucks for um, subscription signups. So Audible is another good one that people like. It's not recurring, but it's flat rates, which means, okay, you got 100 Audible signups in a month for just free trials because free trials are easy for audiobooks. Oh, that's $500 a month and it was easy. And that was like, you know, something that came off of like a couple of videos or something. So like that makes that practical to earn from Amazon with the Audible bounties. They also do bounties on Prime, uh, Amazon Prime trials and things like that. So that's where we'll do a whole breakdown of affiliate marketing. My point of telling you about affiliate marketing is one, I was asked, how did I monetize when I started? And then two, Affiliate marketing, you can use to jump you into brand deals because you can prove revenue. Or once you get brand deals, you can also get the affiliate link and you can double dip, double dip. So I love the double dip. Um, and so that could be very lucrative for you guys. So let's see. I think we have some more questions here. Um, let's see. So Shinobi Sage says, "Hey Roberto, uh, question. I'm in the anime. I am an anime channel who talk, who just hit 1K subs. When do you think I should start a Patreon, YouTube memberships, and affiliate marketing? Okay. So." You can start Patreon with zero subscribers and just have it set up if you understand what you are going to offer. Now, it's not for you to start pitching it at zero subscribers, but setting it up and learning the system and understanding it is fine. 
So you can set it up. It's just a matter of you're not promoting it yet. So you could set it up. So that's fine. You set it up before you're ready. Start before you're ready. That's important. Affiliate marketing, you can start before you're ready because that's just promoting links to things you use or like. So the thing is, there's zero downside to using your YouTube community tab. A lot of you don't use your YouTube community tab. And if you use your YouTube community tab, then you're not penalized on like a video upload when you use your YouTube community tab. So I'm gonna share the screen to show you what I'm talking about here real quick. Um, let's see. So YouTube community tab, YouTube community tab. I think this is, yep, this is it. All right, so I have that on the screen here. So with the YouTube community tab, you can see here I promoted my live stream with me and my boy Daryl Eves. We did something really cool about uh, YouTube's AI dubbing and so on and so forth. You can see here I promoted our free 12-week creator playbook um, and our free email course, which you can get. I have it linked for you. Um, I'll share that link again in a minute. So you can see I use the community tab to promote things. I also interact with you um, guys. I also um, share tips. I share videos in the community tab. I do polls. But one thing you can definitely do with the community tab, I use it to promote my own products like our AI creator prompts. And so, which are also linked in the description of the video, by the way, check that out, awesomecreatoracademy.com. So free plug. Um, the reason I use the community tab is it means I can generate traffic for my own products, affiliate links, even sponsors, traffic to my own website articles, all without having to make a YouTube video and worrying about you leaving a YouTube video. I can even promote my friends like Vanessa Lau. I can use the YouTube community tab. A lot of you ask me, how can I promote on YouTube for free? How can I promote on YouTube for free? I use the YouTube community tab to engage with you guys, do polls, but I also use it to promote things like my free creator playbook, my 12 week free email course, my own products and things for my friends, but also affiliate links. Also sometimes sponsors so that I can meet my sponsor goals by giving them leads, traffic, and revenue that they're looking for. So this is an underutilized tool. I would recommend that you guys use the community tab at least once a day if you can, or at least two to three times a week. You should be using it to grow your email list. You should use it to engage and pull your audience, and you should also be using it to promote affiliate links or your own products like your merchandise, or if you have digital products like I do. So that would be incredibly useful to you guys, and it doesn't cost you a video. You can also schedule it in advance, and not enough of you are doing this. You could also include community tab posts in your brand deal packages, by the way. And you can show off the data and numbers from this from your YouTube analytics of how much engagement you get on these things. So it can be incredibly powerful. For me, I'm growing my email list by 1,000 new subscribers a month now because of this strategy. It helps me get sales. It helps me get emails. It helps me do a lot of things. It helps me get affiliate links. So a lot of you should be using this more. You also should be using Genius Link to track your affiliate links, but also your sponsor links. Sometimes sponsors will not be transparent and share data with you, but if you have your own tracking links through Genius Link that redirect to the link that they gave you, as long as that's working, you still get credit and you still can also have your own data and your own stats so that you know how much traffic you generated for a brand, so you know you can prove that you did a good job and so you have your own statistics. If they're not gonna be transparent and share the data, you will have your own data. So the thing is, 1K is early to promote um, brand deals and trying to get brand deals. 1K is early to try to get brand deals, but 1K is fine to promote um, affiliate links in your community tab. 1K is fine to start getting your first 100 true fans to support you on Patreon for a couple of bucks as long as you have something there to offer. So I don't have an issue with that. Um, 1K subs is fine to start thinking about monetization. YouTube lets you monetize at 500 to 1,000 subs. That's about right. But don't expect big numbers from any of that. It's just the beginning, and it's just a taste to keep you motivated. It's the only thing is you're not going to make livable money with 1,000 subscribers unless you have a business. You're not going to make livable money with 10,000 subscribers unless you have a business. 
uh, unless you're doing a lot of UGC content, but there's caveats to that. However, it's enough of a taste to keep you motivated long enough to build up to something that is reasonable to start making a livable wage. So just consider that. It, you don't, there's no rush. There's no rush. It comes when it comes. And you can build up to it, and it's fine. It takes most people four years, five years minimum. So uh, don't rush it. Take your time. Focus on the audience. If you focus on the audience, everything else becomes easier. I'm not saying it's essential to have a big audience. I'm saying it does make things easier. It does make things easier. So Doug Houston, friend of the channel. Doug has a question here. Oh, Doug doesn't have a question. He's telling you guys how you can ask a question. Thank you for that, Doug. Appreciate it. Appreciate all my mods. Appreciate all my mods. So yeah, I, I would say if you want to start doing these things, because I mean, you know, um, Ray Gloom has a point. I'm saying you could start. I'm saying don't expect much. It's fine if you get 10 people to support you on Patreon. But I think that the sweet spot is when you start getting to 5,000, 10,000 subscribers, a lot of things can start happening for you. Uh, Robbie says, for an anime channel covering Dragon Ball franchise, do you think it would be best to focus on affiliate marketing with products and memberships rather than ad revenue due to copyrights? Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily because even with that, I mean, the Amazon Influencer Program, there are things you can promote to that audience. I'm an anime fan. I'm friends with um, Geekdom 101 and, um, you know, Senpai. So I have like, um, and a couple of other people. I have a lot of friends in the anime community. I have a lot of clients in the anime community. Anime and gaming are rough on monetization, I'll be frank with you, because it's using someone else's intellectual property. Merch can do well when it doesn't rely on the IP and it relies on culture instead, like doing memes or doing kanji-based stuff. So if you do kanji-based stuff and memes, you could sell a lot easier to an anime audience, um, but it's still not perfect because they care a lot about the IP, so it's hard to sell something that's not the IP. The best thing in that situation, actually, believe it or not, if you're an anime channel or uh, and you're doing anime franchise stuff, the best revenue stream besides ad revenue is sponsors and donations, and I would live stream more and get sponsors and donations. Like donations, channel memberships, channel memberships on YouTube and Twitch, and even though they take a ridiculous amount of money for that, in terms of the percentage, it's 30% on YouTube, 50% on Twitch, outrageous in my opinion. Um, and also same on your donations, outrageous for basically being a payment processor. Um, you know, hopefully StreamYard is going to get us um, something to take care of that, at least as far as the donations, hopefully uh, this year. But no promises, um, but hopefully. Um, the thing I would say is that donations and channel memberships are really good if you get it right for that community. Ad revenue, all about how many views you get. If you can make your own merchandise and make it off of culture and memes and things that are agnostic to the IP, things that don't rely on the IP, but are based on the culture of being an otaku, of being a weeb, of being um, you know, an anime fan. Like if you can make otaku centric meat merch, if you can make otaku centric merch instead of IP centric merch, you have a much better chance of making money and not dealing with copyright. And it can go beyond the franchise at that point. So that could be good. That could be good. It basically you make the kind of thing someone would want to buy at hot topic. And then the answer to your woes here is really sponsors. It's all right. So it's ad revenue, it's sponsorship, it's merch that's based on culture and memes and it's donations on the streams and it's YouTube channel memberships. And that's really your business model. That's really your business model for this specific thing that you're doing, Rob. That's the business model. Um, I tell my friend Geekdom 101 the same thing. That is the business model. And the most sustainable thing out of that is long-term brand sponsor, but you do have to deliver for them. But besides that, it's going to be donations from your audience and private memberships. And so that means live streaming a lot and doing a lot, bringing a lot of value, bringing a lot of value. Um, we'll talk about the YouTube new AI policy 
later. But for a lot of you, it it's not going to matter. I doubt the majority of you are using those uh, techniques and technology. So um, it's mostly focused on deep fakes, and it's mostly worried about things that could be look like they're real and be news or fake news. So as long as you're not doing anything that's fake news, I wouldn't worry too much about the new AI policy. And I don't think it's going to apply to thumbnails. It would apply to thumbnails if you like tried to like show like a city that we would know, like Paris on fire or something like that. So again, this is more about fake news than anything else. So I, I'm not concerned about the new AI policy for most of you. For most of you, I'm not worried about it because you're not dealing in fake news. So it shouldn't apply to you, to be honest. It shouldn't apply to you if you're not doing content that would have to be um, considered a potential risk of being fake news. So um, now in the future, because of how broadly this could apply, um, I do think about it from that perspective. So we'll have to see how they handle the policies in the future. And we'll have to um, see what that could look like. Because there is the possibility of false positives. YouTube has been known to make mistakes. Uh, so we, you know, uh, it is what it is. <laughs> so YouTube's not perfect. But... Um, you know, they are doing their best. I am talking to them about this policy because I have concerns. I have a lot of concerns. So I feel you. And we will talk about it later, you know. Um, so Terrence uh, Wild says, is it possible to start a reaction channel and monetize and also become successful? As long as you actually are doing fair use and it's not lazy reaction, and I would try to get your production values really good on that. The gold star for reaction channels right now is React World, and it's also Mr. Beast Reacts, and I would use them as a model in terms of production value. Um, I think reaction videos are actually best if filmed in 60 frames per second, to be honest. I think reaction channels, if filmed in 60 frames per second, is the best, um, but you could also do 30 frames per second, but that's what I would do. But I would really lean in 60 frames per second, if possible, for reaction content, maybe even 4K 60. Um, I think that looks really good. But if you're just starting 1080, 60 frames per second, I think looks really good. looks really clean that way, and it's more engaging. Um, you want to make sure you're doing fair use. I would react to more than one video at a time sometimes, but other things, you would react to big things. You could also do reaction commentary like Asmund Gold, and then that would absolutely be fair use. I'm looking forward to kind of eventually doing um i had one of my um spare channels that was kind of a vlogging thing back in the day uh before like i tried to do it during the pandemic but i just got too depressed during the pandemic um because i wanted to do a, a like but then the pandemic but um now i'm actually thinking of reacting to things on the internet and i'm going to do kind of a combination between it, reacting the way that the sidemen react to things and a little bit of commentary like Asmund Gold. And I'm going to try to make it turnkey so that I don't burn out doing these live streams and then doing reaction channel stuff. And I'm only going to probably do it once a week, to be honest with you, and only if I am enjoying it. So it'll be very sporadic when it starts until I start to enjoy it more and I get used to it. Um, and I'm going to do it for fun. I'm not going to really do it caring if it goes big or blow up. I'm going to do it mostly for fun and just have something not business related to do when it comes to being on the internet. I have hobbies outside of business and outside of YouTube, but that's also like really intense art and photography. Like it's wildlife photography, it's um, painting, it's things that take a massive amount of energy. So I need a more chill hobby than that. That's not video games or reading. Um, so I need, so I'm going to probably just do reactions. But what I would say is I have a client who's going to get a silver play button this year. Um, he came to us with less than 10,000 subscribers, does music reactions. Um, and now he's almost to a hundred K. So he's going to get added to the silver play button connection, uh, collection that we have for, um, awesome creator Academy for the pro group. We have a hall of fame. I'm building it out. Probably some combination of this and the basement. Uh, cause we have like, um, 60 clients that we've done, 60, uh, 60 clients, I think, for silver play buttons, 10 or 12 for gold play buttons. Um, one person sent me the gold play button. Um, I think there are two more that are going to before the end of the summer. Uh, we have about four more silver play buttons that are going to be mailed in soon. So building that out, it's going to be dope. But 
Um, the reaction channel that he did was music based. Now he does like daily reactions, which is why he's growing so fast. But one of the things that you have to focus on with reaction channels is better thumbnails than most people. Things that might be cool or evergreen to for people to watch, not just new all the time. Stuff that people can be really fans of. Um, and the other thing with reaction channels is the same business model for the most part as what we talked about with anime. Anime, gaming, and reaction basically almost all have the same business model because they rely on someone else's intellectual property. They rely on someone else's intellectual property. So the merch has to be memes and culture. So it's merch, which is merch based on memes and culture. So sell your own product. But for entertainment-based audiences, it's very hard if you don't have a candy bar or a coffee brand or an energy drink to sell them. Things get really hard to make money. So most of you, it's just going to be merchandise. And then... Um, with affiliate links, it's a little rough, but you could do it. But I would do more of it in the community tab with Amazon stuff. Just, oh, cool buys on Amazon, favorite things, blah, blah, blah. So, or things related to the IP, things related to the IP. So you could do that every week in the community tab and try to get some Amazon affiliate money. So it's merchandise. You do that. Sponsors is the big one, but you got to do numbers. You got to do numbers. So sponsors is the big one. And then on top of that, of course, it's going to be ad revenue. And then it's going to be once again, it's going to be fan funding. Now, for a reaction channel, if you're not doing a lot of live streaming and building a relationship with your audience, hard to get the super chats. Might be channel memberships of people who just want to support you or extra stuff on Patreon. Um, with the Patreon stuff, you could go more Patreon with a reaction channel because maybe you post stuff that says, hey, reactions uh, too hot for YouTube. And maybe you make that part of the branding and then you do stuff on Patreon for that. So that'd be the business model there. Very similar to what you do for anime, gaming, movie reviews, television reviews, and reaction channels. All of those things have exactly the same business model because once again, they rely on somebody else's intellectual property. And that's why a lot of you are doing it because one, you're passionate about it and it's easier because you don't have to come up with your own ideas as much. So, and it's no offense to anybody, it is what it is, but that's why that's also very competitive. I don't want to say saturated because most of it's crap. The only thing saturated in YouTube is crap. So low hanging fruit, but if you make it better than other people, then it's not as much low hanging fruit. If you can make it higher effort, if you can make it higher effort, then it's not as much low hanging fruit just because the idea is accessible and duplicatable. If your process production and product and packaging is not duplicatable because it's harder than what 90% of beginners can do, that's the trick. So your thumbnail needs to be better than 90% of people so that people can't just steal your thumbnail because they don't have the skill to steal your thumbnail if they tried. Because they could see your thumbnail be like, oh, I'll make that too. But it should be too hard for them to do it. So if you can make your thumbnails better, that's packaging. If you can make your production better and make the better quality experience, they could have the same idea to react to the same thing as you, but their thing will look like crap and sound like crap by comparison. So the thing is, if you're going to do a reaction channel, in my mind, you do it right. You go out and you get at least a sure microphone. Maybe you get the um, M7X, so maybe that's $200. You get a better microphone. Why? Because everyone's going to try to do it with a $50 or $100 microphone. You beat them with a $200 to $500 microphone that sounds better so that no one can stand the sound of their videos when they've heard yours. So that stands out. You get a good camera. You do, and it could be a uh, it could be a Sony ZV-1F and be a five hundred dollar camera. This is a ZV-E10 with a two hundred dollar lens. That would probably run you about eight nine hundred bucks. But again, the person trying to do it on their phone, you're gonna look better. So the thing is, when people see theirs and they see yours, they're just like, ah, I just like the better experience. I just like the effort this person puts in. Boom, you pay more attention to your set design, more to your aesthetic. And it's not always about money, but it does matter sometimes of just standing out. It is about standing out. It is about make it to where when they watch someone else's video and then they watch your video, it just feels off to watch that other video because it doesn't sound as good. It doesn't look as good. It doesn't feel as good. So then you also bring personality. So if you're going to do a reaction channel, it's packaging, production, personality, and you make it very hard for people to compete on that. This applies to video games too, by the way, video games, anime, TV reviews, music reviews, and reaction channels, almost all the same business model, almost all the same content strategy and the content strategy, at least as far as the making of the content, because anyone can duplicate you. You do things that make it hard to duplicate you and you go high effort. So what's the high effort? One, you get the personality developed, you bring the energy, you're a better performer, better presenter, 
um, better persona than all of them. So you do that. You get the production values higher so that brokies can't compete with you and your their stuff looks bad compared to yours, no matter how funny or goofy or whatever it is, your sound quality and image quality and lighting quality and set design beats them, okay? And then you make thumbnails. They're impossible for them to duplicate if they tried because they lack the skill. They lack the skill. The only way they could do it is to literally slap their head on top of your body. You have to make it that good uh, to where that's the only way they can steal your thumbnails. So make it extraordinarily difficult. That doesn't mean making thumbnails that are complicated. It's that you want simple, easy stuff or something. Let me phrase that. You want stuff that looks elegant and simple, but you want it to be hard to do and you want to make it look easy. You want to make it look easy. That's the trick. Having high quality stuff that looks easy. Primary example is like, look, I got multiple camera angles and I've got switchers and I've got built in visual effect. That's something that looks really simple and looks really dope. But it also cost four hundred dollars with my switcher. So that's you know that and that's that's not a flex. That's a hey, I make I made something easy on myself, push of a button. But it does disqualify ninety percent of the market who can't afford to do that. So when you make better quality stuff on a production level, it disqualifies competitors from trying to do it. So even just adding a second camera angle beats ninety percent of the market right then and there. Uh, and this doesn't have to be expensive because by the way, you can do this with. Um, a uh what is it called obs bot obs bot is like 250 bucks and it's an ai 4k 60 frames per second camera that does motion tracking and that could be an edge too and that's only a 250 dollars edge that you need so that can make all the difference in the world so um remember packaging production personality and you can stand out and win on those three verticals in the saturated competitive low-hanging fruit niches like anime TV and movies, video games, um, and reaction content. Those things are saturated with crap at low levels because they're low-hanging fruit. So if you go for the low-hanging fruit, but you make exceptionally high effort, high effort, high quality stuff, and then it's high value because of the way you packaged it is the value, it's perceived value from the packaging, and then you're consistent as hell. It's very hard for them to beat you if you excel in those four verticals. If you excel in those four verticals, it's very hard to beat you. But remember the business model. I told you what the business model is. You cannot sell stuff with the IP because of copyright. So you got to make culture-based and meme-based stuff for that. You got to get sponsors. You can leverage affiliate links, but it's a broke audience that's burning time. So they're not likely to buy anything unless they have a connection to you, in which case they might buy the merch. So you buy, you know, you do the merch thing. Streaming if you can because of the connection, the donations, and channel memberships or Patreon. So that's the business model for that. That's the business model. So uh, Mathema says, has a question and says, question, I have a channel called Torque Driven, almost 10K subs. Congratulations on 10K subs. Start off as a modified car reviews channel, but want to do more car reviews. Is it fine or do I create a new channel? It's still auto enthusiast. I would still do mods from time to time and then i would still transition slowly into the other stuff so for now i would do 50 50 mods and car uh, mod car reviews and regular car reviews i do 50 50 i would even do some versus videos so that your audience kind of gets it and i would do 50 50 and then as you grow a larger audience away from the modification car uh, reviews then you can go to 80, 20, 80% regular car reviews, and then 20% uh, mods. And I would never go 100% and ditch mods. I would always, I would start 50, 50, and then go 80, 20 eventually. So that'd be my content strategy advice to you. Not a question about brand deals, but we'll entertain a few content strategy questions. We're really, this is monetization Monday, y'all. This is monetization Monday. If we can, I want to try to keep today's questions focused on the money. Show me the money. But- we will try to accommodate a few questions on strategy. If you absolutely have a burning strategy um, question, uh, do remember that you can also go to awesomecreatoracademy.com. You can work with me one-on-one, -on -one, or you can join the Academy Pro group, and we answer uh, questions there every day in the Facebook group. And we also uh, do two office hour sessions with live private calls, members-only calls, where we can talk about everything from your brand deals, your content strategy, your monetization. We can roast the hell out of your thumbnails together as a class with your favorite YouTube professor. So... Um, that's something if you want to check out, www.awesomecreatoracademy.com. So plug there. 
So Chris Dillon, I think I'm pronouncing that right, has a question, says, I create gaming and anime skits. I have a great following and the content I make does well. I worked with huge brands in my niche, but can't find deals consistently. Would the starter kit help with that? It would help with helping you better understand pricing and also help you understand what brands want, what a brand wants, what a brand needs, whatever makes them money and gets them reach. Like, yeah, that was uh, my Christina Aguilera there for, so like, yeah, what a brand wants, what a brand needs. Yeah. So anyway, the point is a lot of you don't understand what brands want and need from you. You don't understand how to position the brand deal starter kit will help you because it does give you a media kit like mine. It gives you three designs you can choose from for media kits like mine. We will add more and you'll get lifetime updates as we add more media kits. It also helps you with pitch emails because it writes some of them for you and you then you obviously will modify it, but you won't be staring at a blank screen. So just on pitching yourself and re outreach, that helps a long way anyway. And it's a lot of done for you work there. There's also some good information in there. And we do have a master list of 100 brands that work with creators. And I will be updating that throughout the year, obviously. So, but here's the thing. What I think is if I could give you some free advice, and then if you want to thank me for the free advice, you can get some extra value by buying the brand deal starter kit. So that's a thing, but you don't have to. But if I was going to give you free advice, I would tell you that if you've worked and delivered for those brands, that what you should be doing is you should build a long-term relationship with those existing brands by going back to them, showing them the numbers, talking about how wonderful the partnership was, and that you guys should do more of it and then you should pitch them and say, let's get on a call to discuss a long-term partnership. You guys should be getting on calls with the brands. And you shouldn't try to be negotiating everything in email. Get them on a call. And the other thing, again, if you were in the pro group, what I would tell you is we'd be dr drilling you and you'd be watching some of our training videos on how to pitch and salesmanship and negotiation and uh, pricing. Because the thing that a lot of you suffer from is you don't know how to pitch you don't know how to do outreach. You don't know how to find brands information to get contacts. You refuse to get on Zoom calls or video calls or Google Meets in person, face-to-face -face with your brand partners. And you would find that selling, if you learn how to do it confidently, which we also teach, if you learn to sell and learn to negotiate and learn to speak with confidence and pitch and learn the right questions to ask brands, and learn how to actively listen to what they want or ask them for what they want and how to tell them, hey, just be straight with me. What's your budget on this? Because I can work. I want to work with you. We'd love to do it. It's an absolute yes for me. I just need to know what we're working with and I'll tell you what I can do and I'm going to give you my best. If you can say that with confidence on a call where you can read someone's facial expressions, you can read the room. Email, there's no opportunity to do persuasive speech, not really. Most of you are not good enough copywriters to do persuasive speech in your writing through an email. So you can't sell via email because you're not already a salesman and you're not a good writer. So you probably can't do it. And that's no offense to anybody. I'm just saying that's usually true. For like 80% of you, that's usually true, right? Your best bet is to, since you're charismatic enough to make videos, you should be charismatic enough in a video call with either one-on-one -on -one or with their influencer marketing team, which will be usually, if it's not one person, it's two or three people, usually two will get on a call. And what you should do is you should be able to sell in that call, negotiate in that call, or at least get them to the point where they're saying, let's follow up, let's send you back a budget, let's work out the details, and then you do a follow-up call, and then you close on deliverables, and you close on a call. You don't close on emails. You close on a call. So you have to learn how to be a closer. Coffee's for closers only. Like, yeah, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, okay? Great movie, great movie. Would never get made today, by the way. Would never get made today. But such a great movie. You should watch it. And, yeah, you should learn negotiation and salesmanship and persuasive speech. If um, You could learn any skills long-term in your career. Those are probably the best ones besides any technical skills you learn, any production skills. Those are like the best. Aside from public speaking, public speaking is another good one. But these would be the soft skills versus the hard skills, the technical skills. These are the soft skills. These are the ones of interpersonal relationship skills. And this will help you in your career. And so the thing is, if you're lacking consistency on the brand deals, you've already satisfied brands. A lot of you are just, the problem is you're doing one and dones. You're doing one and dones. You're going on one date with no follow-up with the brand. You know, that's a relationship that had, that was a dead end relationship. 
make commitments, get long-term commitments. If you satisfied a brand, go back to that well, negotiate a long-term contract on six months or 12 months and learn to sell, learn to pitch. And if you're struggling with that, that's where being part of the Awesome Creator Academy Pro Group, you might get to practice. We do role play. We do role play and you can work with me on role play and on your pitch and we can develop you. Um, now, again, you don't have to do that. That is a paid thing that I offer. It's one of the things I offer. But if you can't do that and you can't afford something like that, then you should at least, this is free game. Y'all should at least be practicing with your friend. Why don't you have a creator friend group? This is why I started a membership, by the way. It's because we have a community of people that can help each other. But what you should do if you can't buy into a community like that, at least with the buy-in, people are serious. But if you don't have serious people with a buy-in, you should at least try with a free group. Free groups have so many problems sometimes, but it's all you can afford sometimes. So you should start there. A lot of you should start with whatever costs you zero dollars and do the best you can what uh, the best you can with what you have where you are, zero dollars. So you should be part of free things sometimes. The problem with free things is a lot of times they're not always there's no barrier or vetting people when it comes to free things. So sometimes you're not in there with the best people. That's why if at least you do a small friend group where you guys have like a DM group and it's people you trust and like and know. Now, a lot of you are isolated, so you know that's still a problem for you. But if you can at least have a small friend group of like three or four creative friends, you should practice your pitches and your role play and brand deals together. Someone should pretend to be the influencer marketing manager at a brand and grill you and be hard on you so you can get used to criticism, get used to being lowballed, get used to pushing back until you start to develop the confidence in how you speak and approach conflict in those situations. You could also try this with like debating with chat GPT and asking it to play this role for you too, if that feels safer for you. And what you would do in that situation is what this will do is this will help you develop some of your salespersonship, some of your confidence with pitching. And you, if you can do this with either chat GPT, um, arguing with the AI or with a small friend group, or if you join like a discord server or Facebook group, you should at least try role play sales and negotiations for your brand deals at some point just to get used to the idea of going back and forth with a person uh beyond that you can do it in private communities sometimes there's a benefit there because people are more experienced people are more serious people ask really good questions because not everyone's an amateur with no experience um so they can ask you things that are much more likely to happen in the scenario and they can throw out more real numbers because it's private and stuff like that so that could be helpful for a lot of you. The main thing is to find some way to practice pitching and find some way to practice negotiating and pushing back on sales. Um, however you go about it is up to you, but you got to get your feet wet with that. You really do. And that will um, help probably the far majority of you um, to be better and not be undersold and underpriced in your negotiations. Because a lot of you, you're part of what you're undercharging is a lack of confidence because you haven't practiced sales. Uh, Javon H, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Javon H has a question and says, Roberto, when should I start incorporating my own uh, merch and product when I'm a small channel? Is it worth waiting until a certain threshold? Sorry if you answered this already. Um, I think day z build your merch even or start designing your merchandise from day zero. Include the links in day zero. You don't have to start talking about it in your videos. But I, I have a strategy when it comes to merch and products. Day zero launch with a YouTube channel or podcast or whatever, which means wear your merchandise in your videos and you don't have to say it but link it in the description so at least the opportunity exists and you got people used to seeing it. So then later, as you grow and you get comfortable and say, okay, now I'm ready, now I'm ready, you already have a back catalog where you've been wearing the merch all the time and you'll have people ask, hey, I like your hat, where can I buy it? Hey, I like your t-shirt, where can I buy it? Hey, I like that hoodie, where can I buy it? And then you say, oh, it's linked in my description. Oh, it's linked in my store. Here's my store, go to my blah, 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 and everything. So that would help you. We will be doing another, we've done a workshop on merchandise. We will be doing another workshop on merchandise this year. We will be doing a digital products workshop. Uh, just so you guys kind of know the schedule, we're doing monetization Mondays, workshop Wednesdays, FAQ Fridays. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. That's the menu now. So now it's monetization Mondays, all things money. 
So it's monetization Mondays, workshop Wednesdays, FAQ Fridays. So, you know, and eventually for FAQ Fridays, I will eventually find a way to do a call-in show for high-level super chats or channel members. We'll find something. It'll probably be channel members. We'll find a way to do a call-in show at some point. I haven't figured out the technical back end of that, but we'll do it eventually. But in the meantime, there'll be like super chats and there'll be questions like these. Uh, and I will get to the super chats. I'm just trying to catch up on some of the questions and then we will go to the super chats and I'll give them a little bit more time. Um, I answered twerp driven already. So yeah, so for merch, I, I again, my strategy is weird. It's start before you're ready, day zero launch, wear it in your videos from get go. If you can wear it in your videos from the beginning, wear it in your videos from the beginning. And um, if you guys want an example, and you can, by the way, you can set up a merch shop for $0 here and it will link to the YouTube channel once you have the merch shelf. But I'll give you guys an example if you want to see my current merch and merch store, go to robertoblake.store, robertoblake.store. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna put literally buy my merch in the chat. <laughs> and then I'm gonna um, give you the link for uh, robertoblake.store. This will show you guys what my merch and my merch shop looks out. I did this with fourth wall, you can use Fourth wall, you can use, and it's zero dollars to start with fourth wall. You can start with Teespring and you can start with Spreadshop. Now, the first one, well, I did actually print on demand before all of these. Uh, I did print on demand with like an old school Cafe Press and Zazzle. They don't link to YouTube. I've used everything. I've used Printful, Printify, Cafe Press, Zazzle. I've done more print on demand than most people. I've used over eight or 10 different print on demand vendors. Okay. Uh, Early days before YouTube ever existed, I did Cafe Press and Zazzle.com before YouTube ever existed, okay? Um, I've done Redbubble. Uh, for those of you who might want licensing from major IP holders, you could do Redbubble and it has a thing where you can pay extra for licensing, okay? Um, and I used Spreadshop as one of my early YouTube merch. It was probably the first place I did for YouTube merch. I used Teespring before, which is now Spring for Creators. Um, currently, I'm using uh, fourth wall. I've used Shopify. I've used Printful for the back end. I've used Printify for the uh, back end. Um, so that's like nine of them. And I know I've used something else. So I've used like nine, 10 of these things. Okay. And what I am doing right now is one, I am everywhere so people can buy from me wherever they want. I'm everywhere so people can buy. Uh, everywhere for you can do merch by Amazon, right? But here are the ones that link to YouTube. There are four that link to YouTube Shopify, if you're willing to pay, and then you can source other products or sell and do fulfillment yourself from your own house or warehouse for things like some people do that for their book sales or for signed copies of their product or signed, signed merchandise for extra money. So Shopify is for fulfillment for yourself. You can do fourth wall like I did, which gives you Shopify like aesthetics and features and customization, but zero dollar upfront cost. And uh, you just pay out of your profit margin on your print on demand stuff. And they use for the back end, um, they use Printify for the high quality merch on the back end. And it is high quality. And I've ordered samples for it. It's actually really good. Uh, Spreadshop, who I've used and who's partnered with me for a merch workshop before. They're really good. I use them the longest out of everybody, I think. Um, second longest I think I used was Teespring. Um, they're really good, and they link to the YouTube uh, shopping merch shelf. And then you have, of course, Teespring, Spring for Creators. They link to the YouTube merch shelf as well, okay? Shopify gives you the most customization, but you pay money. Next most customization is... Next most customization is definitely fourth wall as far as customization of your store and your website. But right now, currently, they have two problems that I, I know they're working on. And most of that revolves around the fact that they cannot use EPS and Adobe Illustrator files for your content. It's just PNG and JPEG. You cannot use SVG. EPS and AI, which is vector, which would get you a higher quality image. The good news is they do transfer it to vector on their end. So the thing still comes out high quality. I have no complaints about the quality of the prints based on that. But 
The other one that has some file format limitations is Spreadshop. The one that has the least file format uh, for the print side, the file format issues, is uh, Teespring. However, in terms of that, I know that both Spreadshop and Fourth Wall are doing that. Most of you don't use SVG files, EPS files, or AI files. Um, as AI being Adobe Illustrator, not artificial intelligence, Adobe Illustrator files. So this doesn't matter to you because you're not dealing in vector. But for those of you with a graphic design background and know about high quality prints and know about vector versus raster, that does matter to you. But I do know that both of those companies are working on that and giving you more upload file options for the higher, higher quality instead of um, vectorizing it on the back end where mistakes could happen, but I've rarely seen it. So that's just an FYI. So the best overall, and they're not a sponsor, the best overall thing for this is, in my opinion, currently fourth wall because of the things they are doing and because I feel they have a modern interface. Um, so there are benefits to that. Shopify is the best overall, but it's also the most technical overall, and it does have an upfront monthly cost. There's not a zero free dollar plan for Shopify. So the best zero dollar option is fourth wall, then I would say spread shop, and then last would be Teespring. Um, and Teespring and spread shop are comparable. So again, there's a marginal difference on those two, but I still feel like fourth wall is ahead of both of them currently, largely because of the website customization, the website design, and that looks like a Shopify store, but it costs you nothing. It costs you nothing, but it looks like a Shopify store. So that's why. So I think it just looks better. Um, that's the design nerd in me. So from merchandise question, that's kind of like the merch question. And I'm fine with the merch questions because at least they still do cover monetization, even if it's not brand deal specific. So there's that. Yeah, absolutely. Start before you're ready. Um, I Ray answered this question on Reaction Channels, and I Ray told you the case study on the Reaction Channel and Awesome Creator Academy that's about to hit 100K. Um, Zolo, to my knowledge and Daryl's knowledge, and Daryl talks uh, a lot with YouTube, and I talk with people at YouTube, right now for the AI language dubbing, and I can talk to the rest of my YouTube contacts about this in real time this week because I am talking to them about this policy with AI stuff anyway. Um, I do not believe that it would evolve the ditto dubbing and the language dubbing. Um, and even if it does, for disclosure purposes, yes, but no penalties. No penalties. Maybe for disclosure, but no penalties. We are looking into it. They're not worried about that. You need to know that the scope of what they're worried about, and they just have to be vague because lawyers are lawyers. They have to be vague, and technology also evolves. They're just worried about deep fakes. They are just worried about deep fakes. So do not overthink the AI policy if you're not doing fake news. If you're not doing fake news, don't overthink the AI policy for YouTube because that's who they really care about. I know it broadly applies because the language in terms of service because that's how Google and YouTube are, but, but, what they really care about is deep fakes, y'all. And they care about fake news. If you're not doing deep fakes and fake news, you have much less to worry about. Charlotte Ann Moore, thank you for the $9.99 super chat. Charlotte asks this question. Roberto, do you use other platforms to drive traffic to your YouTube channel, i.e. from your LinkedIn? That's where my followers are. You can, but that's not my strategy because my strategy, but keep in mind, I'm a larger YouTuber and I'm also a businessman, my strategy is not to keep feeding YouTube and stealing traffic for YouTube. I want traffic for myself. I want traffic to go to my newsletter sign up. I want traffic to go to my website, to go to my products for my sales, where I don't split 55% of the advertising with YouTube and where I don't split 30% of memberships with YouTube and I don't split 30% of Super Chats because I think that number, it can be generous for creators who have no money to invest in building their own platform and who have zero dollars, it's a generous offer because you can't make money without them if you're in that situation. So I understand, and it's no shade, no tea, no hate to YouTube. I love YouTube. And I think the monetization is generous and it's great in many ways. However, I'm not a zero dollar creator and I haven't been for a long time. 
And when I can avoid it, I do not want to share my revenue. When I can avoid it, I do not want to share my revenue. I would rather drive traffic to myself than drive traffic to YouTube. YouTube is big enough. YouTube is big enough. If I have someone who wants to do business with me on LinkedIn, because LinkedIn is high ticket clients, I don't think you have any business driving people from your LinkedIn to your YouTube channel. If you have people on LinkedIn who really enjoy what you're doing over there and want to connect with you, you should be driving them to your email list. You should be driving them to your own website to be a customer. You should be driving them to do a DM with you and you should leave them a voice message in their DMs because then that can't be automated fully yet. So they know they're dealing with a human being and you should be direct salesing them. And you should be, if you're in LinkedIn, if you're in LinkedIn, it sounds like you're a professional. If you're a professional, this should be an opportunity. This should be a brand deal. This should be a speaking engagement. This should be a sales opportunity for your product or a retainer for a contract or a digital product sale. That's what, so if you're driving traffic from LinkedIn, you shouldn't be driving traffic to YouTube to get one penny per view. You should be driving that traffic from LinkedIn to selling them into a $99 product, a $299 30-minute coaching call, or a long-term engagement, or a $10,000 a month client retainer if you're a high-level um, um, person in LinkedIn and you're a consultant or something like that, or it should be a brand deal that could pay you 5,000 upfront or 5,000 recurring a month. You have no business taking a warm lead from LinkedIn and driving a warm lead from LinkedIn to YouTube where you're going to make one penny off of that damn view. You have no business doing that. It should be driving someone to your email list that puts them into an automation sequence that upsells them to something that makes you at least 99 bucks or gets them on a call with you uh, closes a deal or turns into a brand sponsorship or a consulting call or a paid speaking engagement or a paid webinar or a JV partnership. Do not give traffic to YouTube for one penny of view if you're a thought leader, a tenth of a penny of view if you're a influencer. If you're going to have that traffic, drive it to something that at least for the love of God, if it doesn't make you 99 bucks, it should at least make you 20 bucks. That's my issue with a lot of creators is you're sitting there driving traffic to YouTube. YouTube is big enough without you. You're going to get a penny for every view that you get if you're lucky. And a lot of you are not thinking, why am I not driving that to something that gets me at least a $9 sale or a $99 sale or something? And for a lot of you, you could do that if you had a newsletter and email list. You could at least eventually get 9 bucks to 99 bucks from a lead that you know, if you aren't driving them to YouTube, if you drive them to your own website or to your own email list, or at least to your merchandise store, at least to your own product, if you're not going to be a business and a salesperson, at least, like, what's more valuable, a YouTube view or a website link to your merch? Think about this in real time. Like, this is why it's Monetization Monday. Make sure you all come back, you know, come back, uh, y'all, you hear? <laughs> yeah. Come back, you know, that's the Southern thing. Like, come back next week, Monetization Monday, because you need this. You need Monetization Mondays, because think about it. You guys are driving traffic to YouTube. You're getting one penny per view, if you're lucky, because a 1,000 views at one penny per view is a $10 RPM, a $10 RPM. That's a business channel. So why would you do that? If you at least drive them to an affiliate link, you might make money every month if they buy from the affiliate link, or a one-time commission, which if it's an Amazon audible subscription for free a free trial that's five dollars a lead instead of a penny of view five dollars a lead is better than a penny of view if you have merchandise you'll make six eight twelve dollar margin depending on your merchandise and how you priced it so again you're talking about eight nine ten dollars a lead you guys are passing on dollars to pick up pennies on youtube i want you to understand that and this is no offense to anybody by the way this is no offense and charlotte um love you thank you for the ten dollar super chat but this is my point a lot of you are passing over dollars to pick up pennies because you're caring more about YouTube views than you are about converting sales or leads. And I'm not saying don't build an audience. I'm saying if I have other social media platforms, why would I ever use my other social media platforms to give YouTube traffic it does not need from me when that traffic is something I desperately need for myself? So my other social medias do not exist to grow my YouTube channel, not at all. My other social media platforms exist to grow my brand, not YouTube's platform. They exist to grow my email list, not YouTube's platform. They exist to grow my website traffic, not YouTube's website traffic. So I think you need to be 
All of you need to be more selfish with your social media instead of using it to grow YouTube. You need to stop and you need to divest from that identity of I'm a YouTuber and be a content creator and say that my content serves my audience first and then I benefit in value through that exchange by delivering value for my audience, meeting them where they are. I meet my audience where they are, I deliver value for them. If I deliver enough value for them, then they are willing to follow me wherever I go. And the most valuable place for them to follow you to is not YouTube. It's to your own home. It's to your own home. Boom. Value bomb. Value bomb. Creighton TV, $9.99 super chat. Hey, Roberto, what are your thoughts on the toughest hurdles you faced when you were starting your business, YouTube journey, and how did you overcome them and reach your current levels of success? Inspiration, God bless. Thank you so much, Creighton TV. I would say it's that I didn't know what I didn't know. I knew a lot of things, but I also learned every single day how ignorant I was. And it wasn't for a lack of trying to be educated. It wasn't for a lack of being educated. It wasn't for a lack of having smarts. It's that experience and failure are the best teachers there are. And the best thing is being humbled and learning how much you don't know by trying to do better every single day and by looking at other people who are where you wish you would be, where you wish you could be, and then looking at their example and then realizing that you don't know how they got there. And asking yourself, well, how did they get there? Or even asking them. And so the thing is, I overcame my toughest hurdle, which I think my toughest hurdle besides, I was plenty motivated and ambitious. I was self-driven, motivated, and ambitious. And I had a lot of external circumstances. I looked at my external circumstances, not as barriers or circumstances that were holding me back or being underprivileged. I look at those, I looked at those as fuel and motivation and a reason to be scrappy and to fight and to be an underdog. And that, but I grew up in the eighties. I grew up on Rocky and the karate kid hardship is not, Oh, well, look at me. I'm going through hardship. I'm going through struggle. I'm disadvantaged. Oh, I just need a handout or I need um, some help or I need uh, a wise mentor. Right? No, I grew up on those things. And what it taught me is that that is motivation to beat the crap out of people who are soft or to outcompete people who are soft. So I like underdog advantages. I like starting from nothing. I like it because I like knowing I can take a punch, spit the tooth out, and go another round, and and that the other person is just be like, oh God, why am I dealing with this person? I, I I like that if you want it, like you can want it more than other people, and so that's powerful. So uh, that could be really good. The thing is, though, motivation is not enough. Um, discipline is not enough. You also need the wisdom and the humility that experience and failure bring. And they will teach you what you really need to know. And you can fail up. You can fail your way up. I've learned much more from my mistakes and other people's than I ever learned from success and victory. Failure is a much better teacher than victory. In fact, victory often teaches the wrong lesson. Victory teaches you that you're invincible, that you're a god, that you're all-knowing because you haven't failed yet. And that also means you're also not challenging yourself enough and you're not stretching enough. Humility and failure are much more valuable than victory and success when it comes to learning. And they it, um, they give you real strength when you've because then you know you earned your power. You earned your power. Um, it's much better to gain experience from failure and humility than to be the beneficiary of privilege and nepotism early on in your career. A lot of people love that that advantage and blowing up fast and all of that. You're better accumulating scars and accumulating calluses and learning how to avoid fatal blows and knowing how many punches you can take and knowing your limitations and testing and stretching beyond them. Um, over a period of time, you are much better through that long road of suffering. You are much better going through hell than being privileged. And um, that is something that most people will never fully appreciate because the suffering sucks early on. But I'm a, I'm a, a tremendously grateful um, to that and knowing how to do more with less because it also helps with anxiety because you get to remember where you came from and knowing that I'm much better off because if I had lost my resources, I can't lose my knowledge. The thing that I'd be scared of is losing my knowledge. 
I'd never want, if I have the choice between going back in time and starting with my resources or starting with my knowledge, I'll start with my knowledge all the time because I'll lose my resources because I'm ignorant. If I go back in time with all of my resources, I will lose them very fast because I will be a fool and a fool and their money are still soon parted. And I'd much rather have my wisdom. My wisdom is much more valuable. My experience and my suffering and pain is much more valuable than any of my other resources. And it's not close. It's not close. Because the thing is, I can't downgrade if I, it's not a real downgrade if I keep my knowledge because it was the knowledge that got me here. And the thing is, things theoretically are easier, faster. Now there's better technology. There's all those things. So I'd rather have my knowledge than my resources if I have to choose between the two because I can re reacquire what I gained in resources. I don't know that I can reacquire knowledge if I start from ignorance again because I won't even know how ignorant I am. I won't even know how ignorant I am. So that's why I think was the toughest. It's that I had no clue what I didn't know and what I should be asking, even when I got opportunities, I was in the room with some of the smartest people in the world. I didn't know what the right questions were yet. I wouldn't have the experience. So it didn't benefit me if I was in the right place, the right time, the right people. The problem is I wouldn't ask the right question because only experience gives you that. Only experience and the pain of going through not asking the right thing and realizing too late. Only pain and only um, that experience with failure and the humility that grants you can offer you any wisdom and knowledge is not wisdom there's a lot of people today that have more knowledge than anyone's ever had but they're lacking in wisdom and so for me it was the hardest thing to overcome is to reconcile your own ignorance and to also find the humility to ask good questions ask for help and even to literally ask someone hey i'm new in this space what is it I should be asking? What don't I even know that I should be asking you about? What is not something that is on people's radar? What is something that people, here's a great question to ask someone. If you ever find yourself in the room with a very smart person, ask them, what is something that nobody ever asked you that you wish they would so that you could share that knowledge with them? That's a fantastic question to ask a smart person because like, okay, here's the thing I would tell somebody that no one ever asked me about but would make all the difference in the world. And when they can tell you that, that is going to be secret knowledge. And the thing is, nobody in the room with them would have asked that. And you'll get that information out of them and no one else will. And that wedge could be your advantage and could be all the difference in 10Xing, okay? So yeah, the thing when I was starting out in business and YouTube, the thing that was the toughest barrier was realizing and acknowledging and having some humility about knowing how utterly ignorant and un and unwise I was because I had no experience at certain things. That was it. And I don't think most people will admit that, by the way. I think most people are too proud to admit that. I think that too many people are proud are just prideful prideful and will not admit that. Um, Terrence Wild asks question from Roberto. How are my thumbnails in your opinion? Uh, not reviewing people's thumbnails today. Uh, Dale Daniel says, question, I haven't started my channel yet. Start now. Start thinking about it. You don't have to launch your channel and make a video today. But what you should be doing is writing down ideas today. You should be thinking about your branding and thumbnails. You should be sketching that out. You should be picking your color palette today. You should be thinking about what you want your videos to look and sound like. You should be thinking about what you want your set design to be. Uh, Lone Wolf and Cub Kung Fu says, should I pay to promote my YouTube channel? Nope, absolutely not. Never messes with the algorithm. Also waste of money. And do not use the promotions tab. The promotions tab is for brands to use, just like in Instagram. In Instagram, the promotions tab in Instagram is for brands. It's for companies. And it's because using the Facebook ad system is too complicated for millennials and Gen Z. It's very boomer designed. It's very outdated. The same thing with Google advertising. It's very boomer and it's very hard to use. And the majority of people in marketing today are millennials and Gen Z. 
and the thing they're used to is the platform that they consume on. So what YouTube did, just like Instagram, following off of Instagram and copying them, it created the promotions tab there to make it easier for people to buy ads, especially during the pandemic when a lot of people started e-commerce companies. So it's really for brands and e-commerce companies is the promotion tab. It's not meant for content creators. I need to make a short video about this. Never, ever, ever use the promotions feature in YouTube. It's not for you. You don't understand it and it will ruin your channel. It is only for people who are directly using that to sell with their advertising. It's for someone who makes an ad, wants that ad on YouTube, and brands have YouTube channels. The majority of brands have YouTube channels now. You see it. That's where all the ads come from that give us our ad revenue. So it's really just for brands to have an easier way so that they can increase YouTube's ad revenue. It's not meant for creators, but brands have YouTube channels just like we do as creators. The promotions tab in YouTube, the promotions button in YouTube, that feature is for brands and e-commerce. It is not for you as a creator to grow your channel. It's not for that. It's not a good idea. So US plus dad, $10 super chat. Thank you so much. Says we grew a, Ro a Roblox channel to over 300 subscribers off of mainly shorts. Congratulations on that. Even though shorts doesn't pay anything. Um, we're going to start a separate channel for videos, but another successful creator said brands prefer everything on one channel. Thoughts. It depends on how you're approaching things. I think at that size of subscribership, you should do the Roblox stuff on the main YouTube channel, and I think it should be long, and I think it should be storytelling, and I think you should tap into the trends of other popular Roblox channels. I see the same thing with Minecraft creators, by the way, and other sandbox games. Minecraft, GTA, Roblox I actually know this niche better than you think. I've worked with 1 million subscribed uh, Minecraft and GTA channels before. Um, not going to name their names without permission, but what I will tell you is I think you can do the shorts and then I think you can do long form. The problem is you need to temper your expectations and then you also need to consider that the shorts and the brands and the views are gonna be different. Your views on short form, your regular videos on YouTube will get either one tenth or one hundredth per, uh, of the same views and the same reach and the same impressions. Shorts is steroids for channels and it grows them faster. So you're gonna have to take your expectations of what your normal Roblox videos on shorts do, and you're gonna have to divide that number by 10 or divide that number by 100, and that's your view floor for your regular YouTube videos. That is your view floor for your regular YouTube videos. However, what you should do, and this is key, is you should start vertical. If you grew off of shorts for Roblox gaming, do vertical live streaming every week two to three, maybe two times a week, three times a week for this Roblox channel. Actually, US Plus Dad, you guys probably, as a Roblox channel, you guys probably are a candidate to work with me for one-on-one -on -one coaching. I think that there may be a link to that in the description. If not, uh, just uh, go to awesomecreatoracademy.com. Um, I could probably even um, drop you the link here in the chat, but um, you should probably work with me because I've done stuff like this before in um, niche, well, in your niche of gaming, but also in sandbox um, games. And what I will tell you is you should embrace YouTube's new vertical live streaming and you should live stream, if not daily. Um, and if you're not doing it daily, you should at least be doing it two to three times a week. You guys will blow up on vertical live stream because it's in the same vertical feed as the shorts. They're kind of rebranding the shorts feed and calling it the vertical feed now in YouTube. So it's a it's a different thing. I've worked with gaming channels like right now. Um, there's a channel that's doing. Um, God, what is it? It's not Brawl Stars. I think it's Clash Royale. I want to say. I think I want to say it's Clash Royale that they're doing, right? So they're doing Clash Royale and they're doing vertical live streaming and they just started doing vertical live streaming and they're doing like 100,000 views on vertical live streaming with Clash Royale, right? So for Roblox, if you're doing shorts, you should format for vertical live streaming, do that multiple times a week, and then you can get huge numbers off of that because you already have a vertical audience and you'll be in this vertical feed and it's a new feature. YouTube's pushing it very aggressively and that will help 
gin up your numbers on that. And so then if you're doing really good on shorts and then really good on vertical live streams, if you're doing widescreen videos and you're doing those ever so often and they're not hitting the same numbers, you'll be forgiven on that a little bit more on brand deals. And what you can do for the sponsorships is you could get sponsors for the vertical live streams. And then with those live stream numbers being high, that'll look really good for the brands. So that's what I think more shorts creators should be doing is these vertical live streams. You leave the replays up of these vertical live streams, by the way, you also get to monetize those with ads and ad inserts. You can add multiple ads in them after the fact as well. So from a monetization standpoint, it's actually really good for y'all. So again, um, US plus dad, you should probably reach out to me about one-on-one -on -one coaching because we could build a strategy around this for you and making you a multi-format channel because you actually could be a very, very good multi-format channel. And I don't think you should be scared of the fact that you're going to get like a 10th or a 100th of the views on regular videos. Your answer is vertical live streams is where you'll make your real money on sponsorships and where you'll make your real money on ad revenue. And you don't need to start a new channel for this, but I do have a strategy for you starting another channel just for the sake of making more money because you have data that we could use in YouTube. You have data from this channel that we could use to exploit that niche and it'll be a slower channel to grow, but it'll be another channel under your umbrella that can make money. So you could have this main channel that's 300K and you can print a lot of money with this, but you could also just go ahead and launch another channel or we could use this and you could be another Roblox channel or you could use this data and we could spin off into another game like Minecraft, for example, and then you can grow another huge channel um, in the Minecraft niche and we could use similar tactics. So again, you're someone I'd want to talk to about content strategy. You qualify for coaching with me and we could work something out there. But a lot of you don't understand how to be a multi-format channel. And that's fine because it's a new thing. It's very difficult. And YouTube has not made it as easy as they claim. Um, and there are some glitches to work out. But it is possible to make this work. And more of you who are doing shorts content and you're winning on shorts, your answer is to pivot to vertical live streams. And it's also using that same vertical feed in YouTube. And I think that that's the right move for you. Now, does that mean I think your regular video should also be vertical? No, because it's a reach issue. It's a reach issue. And you have to understand that these formats are all very different and that you're going to get a 10th or 100th of the views on a regular YouTube video if you grew a shorts audience, because every audience is a different psychology and every format is a different psychology. But weirdly, there is a big relationship between FOMO shorts viewers and they could become FOMO live viewers. There's a psychology overlap between extreme on short and extreme on live, but not necessarily in the middle. Too many of you are worried about, I want to convert my shorts viewers to long form videos. Nah, not really worth it psychologically. Too many barriers on the psychology. But getting vertical viewers to live streams that works if they're a vertical live stream. If they're a vertical live stream, that works. That's why TikTok did it. That's why TikTok did it. That's why YouTube's doing it. So it's just a um, strategy is if you want to go beyond. All right. So amateurs use tactics. Professionals use strategy. And masters use psychology. That's a Roberto Blake quote, by the way. That's a Roberto Blake quote. So remember, amateurs use tactics Professionals use strategy and masters use psychology. Shinobi Sage has a question. Hey, Roberto, how would I casually go about promoting affiliate links in my community tab description video without coming out as pushy? Uh, just do a best of. Do a best of this or a top 10. Um, you could also, or even do a top five. And what you could do is you could use the um, carousel, you use the graphics carousel, make one by one squares, like 1,000 by 1,000, it's a one by one aspect ratio squares, and showcase images of cool stuff and say, hey, here are the top five blah, blah, blah for the week that I recommend, and it could be whatever, and it could be, um, like, if, it's, if you have anime fans, if you're an anime channel, maybe you find really dope statues from the anime, like if it's Dragon Ball, find like the best Goku, Vegeta, Ultra Instinct, Ultra Ego statues, on Amazon and find those and then showcase those. Or if it's Gundam, you do Gundam model kits, whatever. And then when people see those carousels of, ooh, 
dang, that looks really cool. That looks, oh man, I would buy that. Yeah. And then you have the links, the Amazon links in the uh, text portion. People are like, yeah, I'm going to buy that with your link, man. Thanks for telling me. Oh, affiliate link got you. I'm going to use your affiliate link and I'm going to go get the statue now because I got money in my pockets. And so the people who aren't broke will use it and they'll be happy because they're like, ooh, I didn't even know that existed. Man, I want that. That's going in my cart right now. And that's how you would do it. That's how you do it in your niche. Um, Sister Camilla says, hey, Roberto, can I use eBooks on fourth wall? Technically, you can because you can sell digital products on fourth wall. However, um, if you're selling it directly like that, then it means you're not getting the Amazon review for it. So that's the downside. But yeah, you can. You can um, sell eBooks. Uh, you can sell eBooks. You can sell clothing. It also has print on demand stuff and everything like that. So you can do posters and things too. Uh, yeah, Nightbot is being a little aggressive. I'm going to try and turn down the settings on Nightbot moderation uh, so it doesn't um, hurt you guys for posting caps. But yeah, uh, I use Nightbot to help me a little bit. Um, Metrics Mule says, hey, Roberto, I've had problems with brands paying me the second portion of 50-50 after upload. They'll pay the first 50% because they're ego, but then they uh, I have to become a debt collector. That can happen. It's a pain in the butt. But most of the time, if that's happening, it means you didn't have a contract. And most of you, your problem with brand deals is you don't put contracts in place and you don't put the terms of payment for your invoicing in place. And what, sh what you should do is you should have your own contract or add an amendment to the contract they send you and say, hey, I have a standard practice that if I'm paid late after the agreed upon date, uh, which might be net 15, net 15 is 50 days, 15 days after publish, net 30 is 30 day after publish, net 60 is 60 days after publish. Industry standards are net 15 and net 30 most of the time. So up to 15 to 30 days, usually to give them time to do processing and things like that on their end, um, and for cash flow reasons. And so what you do is you in, you have a penalty to where they pay either a 5% uh, late fee if, um, if it's um, more than two days past the agreed upon date. Uh, so if it's net 15 and they pay you 18 days later, maybe they have to pay in the contract. It says, hey, you have to pay a 5% late fee um, or something like that. Then, boom, you do that. Um, in a long-term partnership, that doesn't become necessary. And sometimes that can be something that makes it harder to get a deal. But if you're that worried about it, then you definitely do that. Me, it's annoying when brands are late on paying their bills but I don't worry about it because it's long-term relationships. I know all these people are good for the money. Uh, and then the other thing with me is I have enough other income streams and revenue streams to where I'm not haranguing them and I'm not worried about it as much. I try to also make sure I try to have cash reserves to where I'm not worried about it. And like, oh, they haven't paid me. Oh, I can't pay the mortgage now. It's like I try to be ahead of those things. So you want to start trying to put yourself in a position where you don't have anxiety about that sort of thing one way or the other, but it does suck to have to become a debt collector of the brands. I find contracts help you not have to run them down as much and be a debt collector. Uh, the lady writes says, how well do blog channels do? Vlog channels don't do as well a lot of times. There are exceptions to this rule. My friend Benji Travis and his wife Judy Travis are great at it. They're also OGs in the space. For a lot of vloggers, I'll be real. Vloggers, gamers, reaction channels, and anime channels are all notoriously bad at business. YouTubers in general are notoriously bad at business. And that's no disrespect. That's just how it is. And we all know it. And we all know it deep down. Because why are you bad at business in a lot of these cases? It's because you guys are mostly doing something purely because you enjoy it and you're passionate about it and you want money, you need money, but it's not at the top of your mind. Monetization is not at the top of your mind. It becomes an issue because you want to be fairly treated, you want to be compensated, and you want to eventually maybe do what you're passionate about for a living. But you're not driven and motivated by business. I love everything I do and I'm passionate about it, but I'm weird. 
I've always cared about money ever since I was a little kid watching DuckTales. Scrooge McDuck was my mentor. And when I was a very, very little kid, we had things pretty good. When I was, when I was for the brief period where I was a uh, only child and I was only a big brother to one for a couple of years there for about 10 years, uh, it wasn't that we were in a situation that would make me aware of like scarcity or anything like that. Not early on, because like my parents didn't get divorced until I was a teenager. But what I will say is I was always money conscious because I was taught coming from an immigrant family to be money conscious, even if it's not a scarcity or resource issue, you're just taught more about caring about money, your allowance, frugality, you go to flea markets. It's just an immigrant culture thing, right? So I've always been money focused in some way or fashion, but I enjoy it. But I also enjoy making money because I enjoy trading my skills and being acknowledged. It's a way of being acknowledged and it's a way of making yourself feel respected. And you're taught that in the immigrant culture. You're taught that as a first generation American that, hey, you should be respected. And one of the ways that people respect you is when they're willing to pay you what you say you're worth um, or more. And they show you respect and they show you value by doing that. That's why I do care about money. And that's why we're doing monetization Mondays. So why do I say all of that? I say that because a lot of people who are artistic and passionate and are very, I love what I do uh, enough to where I started doing it for free. A lot of people like that, they get exploited in this industry. And that's why I push so aggressively against the, oh, just do it because you love it and don't ever care about the money. I disagree. I'm not saying you have to be money hungry or money first or driven like that, but I want more people to care about the money because if they don't, they'll be exploited by people who do, if that makes sense. So the problem with the with vlogs a lot of time is vlogging becomes a, I'm making what I want to make much more than I'm making what my viewers want to watch. Vlogging is I want to share my experience, my journey, and express myself more than I want to grow an audience, get views, um, do what people want, give them what they want. That makes it difficult because then it makes a lot of things unpredictable. Now, unless people develop a pair of social relationship and become addicted to you, then that becomes a very different horse of another color. So the thing is, vlogs usually do very well or very poorly on monetization with a lot of a lack of anything in between. So what I tell people to do is if you want to do a vlogger, be a vlogger, my answer is this. Don't make vlogs, make vlog-like content. So what do I mean by make vlog-like content? Make the aesthetic of a vlog, but then instead of doing a vlogging channel, Make a lifestyle channel, and this is really big with female content creators. I highly recommend this for a lot of you. Make a lifestyle channel with a vlog-like aesthetic, meaning make a lifestyle channel, plan and outline, if not outrightly script your videos. It does not have to be a 100% authentic day in my life. This is my life. You actually should become a lifestyle channel become a niche lifestyle brand and a curated lifestyle brand with a curated narrative, aesthetic, and storyline. It's not that you're lying. It's not that you're making inauthentic content. It's that it's an 80-20 rule of the fact that you are being intentional and thoughtful about your image as a lifestyle brand, what you portray as a lifestyle brand, what you're aligned to, and what your audience likes, especially the female-centric audience. So what you're going to do is you're going to make lifestyle reality TV content that is loosely scripted, has an outline, has maybe some story arc or has something, is built with brands in mind, by the way, for affiliate marketing and sponsorship. And this is how you escape the trap of people who are passionate about vlogging and sharing their life, not making any money and becoming starving artists or, you know, finding themselves trapped. This is how you approach it is you make reality TV style content around a lifestyle brand with the aesthetic of a vlog and the relatability of a blog, a vlog, meaning you reply to your comments. You actually reply to your comments. So now your audience, which will most likely be a female or family centric audience, gets to watch you in your lifestyle, aspire to your lifestyle, want to buy the same products and have the same lifestyle as you, which makes you great and brand friendly. You still get to showcase aspects of your life, but it's much more curated. You get to set boundaries because you're curating now. So you're setting more boundaries and you're 
having a much more healthy relationship and it's not a completely parasocial relationship now you they can engage with you the way that they wish they could engage with reality tv stars and you become their reality tv star so what you do is you build a lifestyle brand a curated lifestyle brand for a specific audience and demographic and psychographic you build an audience avatar this is why again you would work with me if you wanted to like do something like this so we can map it out together but you Find your audience avatar and say, okay, it's um, families or women or couples or whatever, uh, women in college, uh, millennial women, Gen Z women. You'd figure out your audience avatar. You'd figure out their preferences. You'd figure out their likes and dislikes. You'd figure out their challenges. You'd figure out their value system, and you'd find their brands that they're aligned with, and you'd curate the brands they're aligned with. They'd be represented in your content or aligned to your content. You'd reach out to those for sponsorship. You'd use those for the affiliate links. You'd find the best brands for then Amazon, and you'd promote those as your links. You'd use those things and wear those clothing and do this and do that, and you'd curate this lifestyle style brand. You do it across YouTube, Instagram, and most likely TikTok. You do it probably YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, maybe even duplicate that over to Snapchat even. Okay. Um, and then the way that you'd approach that, and this is also how you'd mo be monetizing because you'd be monetizing across multiple platforms. So you'd be earning multiple platform revenue. You'd have larger distribution for your affiliate links. You'd use multiple affiliate links, not just the Amazon affiliate links, okay? You'd consider doing something like maybe TikTok shop in that case, and you'd also curate products for there and do wholesale markup stuff, and you'd do that, a form of affiliate marketing kind of slash maybe drop shipping. So you'd figure that out, okay? You could even possibly do some Etsy stuff to do your own stuff or and or your own product line too or your own merchandise or clothing line. That could happen. You could do a direct-to-consumer product in the future possibly and sell your own product or your own jewelry. Or you could do a collaboration with a brand that goes beyond sponsorship where a brand builds you your own custom product that, and then it's a collaboration and you get a royalty and a margin on the product. So that's the other reason you can build a lifestyle brand. That's the other reason you can build a lifestyle brand. That's another way to monetize this. See, this is why I've mastered monetization across niches It's like, and across platforms. It's like you could layer this and scale it. You could layer and scale this. And so this is how you'd escape the vlogging trap is you'd build a curated lifestyle brand, probably more female-centric. You'd have these multiple monetization methods that you'd build out uh, in your ecosystem your own products so that you have margin and you're not platform dependent. No one wants to be a digital sharecropper forever. You'd build behind the scenes content to probably build a Patreon around that with your own domain name, you know, just for extra um, perks there. And what else would you do there? Uh, with Patreon, you could also do micro transactions there, I believe. Now, now they have that. What else would you do? Hmm. We talked about the merch slash clothing line. We talked about direct to consumer. We talked about the possible ability of Etsy store. We talked about affiliate marketing. We talked about the brands. You'd make multiple platform revenue, not just ad revenue. Hmm. Well, with that, you could also do like these personal ask me anything things and you could make them an event and you could probably stream every week and you could multi-stream. Shout out to StreamYard, our sponsor. You could multi-stream and then you could be getting donations because you could vertical and you could multi-stream on YouTube and Instagram at the same time, probably TikTok as well. Actually, yeah, you could. So you go YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, all at the same time, vertical live stream, get massive reach, get a bunch of donations off of that um, when you're doing those and doing that AMA or you're doing IRL um, as a lifestyle brand instead of a vlog, you'd be a lifestyle brand and that's how you do that. And so, yeah, that would be the monetization that I would use. That would be the business model. And that's how you would make real money in that niche is you have the aesthetic and relatability of a vlog, but what you really are is a lifestyle brand doing reality TV content. So you make your stuff reality TV. You make your own version of keeping up with the Kardashians, but down to earth for normal people. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah. So again, that's how the modern version of vlogging could work. Juan Camilo Rosa Jimenez says, hey, Robert, I hope I got all that right. 
Um, Roberto, thanks for the value you give. A quick question. May shorts based on long form videos hurt the growth of a YouTube channel when the goal is to create long form videos? So the strategy, like I said, is I would actually use shorts and grow a shorts audience and I would daisy chain shorts using the related videos link to more shorts. Shorts viewers want to watch shorts. I would not assume or try to force long form content on shorts viewers. You use shorts and shorts will actually get you growth in subscribers and it could get viral views. Could is the key operating word. There has the potential, has a very high potential, right? So you use shorts to enhance your reach and to get subscribers. And then subscribers, subscribers don't give you the possibility to gain more views. Subscribers just get you past the bias that people have against small YouTubers. So the thing is it avoids the cold start problem. We all know that some people, mostly young people, have a bias of not wanting to watch small YouTubers because it's not approved by other people. Young people are sheep. No offense to young people watching this. Y'all, the young people who watch me, y'all are the real winners. Y'all are the hustlers. Y'all are the future. The young people not watching me, you're sheep. <laughs> so the <laughs> that's my joke. That's my joke. But like the reality is that a lot of young people have um, pre-selection bias, right? Pre-selection bias means if a large group of people approve this, it must be good, which is not true. What is popular is not always good. What is good is not always popular. But mostly the younger you are, the more you fall for this concept of using status or group think in pre-selection bias. So subscribers and getting large subscriber counts helps you overcome pre-selection bias. It does not help you in the YouTube algorithm at all to get more subscribers. All it does is signal to people that are lower frequency that you're higher value. So it's all status. It's all status. It's graft. It's not grift, but it is graft. So, so shorts helps new creators and even established creators overcome pre-selection bias by allowing them more reach. More reach is more conversions of viewers to subscribers faster without thumbnails or anything getting in the way. So again, helps avoid some pre-selection bias because no thumbnails because of the serendipity randomness of shorts algorithm. So then that gives you exposure. Exposure gets you subs. It's not about your long form views at that point. Now people are actually judging long form views less harshly when they see someone even has shorts. They go, oh, well, that person grew off shorts. Oh, okay, I get it. Blah, blah, blah. And then so like it's it's just destigmatizing that more. So the thing is you can get subscribers. Those aren't going to convert to long form viewers, but that's not the point. Long form viewers... Uh, right. Shorts viewers are shorts viewers. Video viewers are video viewers and live stream viewers are live stream viewers. You should cultivate in theory, all three audiences. Now, again, am I practicing that on shorts? No, I have a highlights channel where I'm prioritizing shorts. Will I? Yes. I have a plan for shorts for this channel. It's an experiment and we're going to use it for data collection and it's an experiment. Now, my old strategy before they killed off links in shorts was going to use it for affiliate marketing. That was my original plan. Now, I can't really monetize shorts as easily because it's harder to sell. So I was like, okay, well, that feels worthless to me. What can I do there? So my new thing with shorts is I have a new strategy for shorts that is really specific to me where I'm going to do a completely different category of content than people would expect from me with my shorts when I launch this. And I'm only going to make like, I'm going to try to make somewhere between 30 and 100 shorts for this test. And they're going to be evergreen shorts. And because they're evergreen shorts, their only value and goal is to jump my subscriber count. That's their only goal. They are not meant to translate people to long form. I actually have no intention of that. I plan on getting them to binge watch 10 YouTube shorts from me and to subscribe to me. That's my real plan for shorts. My only plan for shorts is binge watching sessions because if I get people to watch three shorts in a row, five shorts in a row, it's like them watching a regular video by that point. And it's not about me making the part one, part two, you have to watch part one, part two. It's about making you curious enough to binge watch something where, because again, my version of it is I'm going to give you rant. I'm going to give you YouTube facts. I'm going to give you YouTube facts. And I'm going to give you facts about content creators. And then I'm going to, if you're interested in content creation and social media, you'll want to be like, when I tell you, oh, here's how many YouTube play buttons there are in the United States uh, currently. Like, oh, here's how many YouTube play buttons there are in the world. Here's how many channels have a gold play button in the entire world. Here are the five countries with the most YouTube play buttons. 
here's how many videos YouTube like here like Mr. Beast had this many subscribers when he was a small YouTuber and it took him 10 years to get to blah blah blah. It took him five years to get to blah blah blah. Like people will care about that stuff. Oh, here's a big YouTuber. Here's how many uh videos they had to make to get their first 1,000 subscribers. Like that people care about random facts like that. Um Oh, here's how many channels are monetized in YouTube. Uh, subscribe for more YouTube facts. That's how I'm going to get people with shorts. They probably won't even realize the content I make in long form because they'll only care about my short form, and that's okay. I'm planning on creating a short form audience and giving them 100 videos to binge watch and leaving them alone if they never want to watch my long form i don't care they have 100 short form videos give me 100 give me 100 minutes of watch time then watch 100 short form give me 50 minutes of watch time give me 60 minutes of watch time watch 60 short form videos i don't care that's my hack my strategy for shorts is to make a shorts only audience and to make exclusive short form content and if they want to watch my long form fine they want to tune into my live streams fine if they never want to watch anything from me from shorts, at least they can watch a hundred of them. That's my trick. That's my plan. That's my plan. And I'm okay with that. So like now for the rest of you, is that exactly what you should do? Maybe, maybe not. But I'm going to tell you what I do believe is that if you're going to make YouTube shorts, the goal should not be to convert them to long-form viewers. Let them decide to do that on their own. Don't even link them to the long-form videos. Link them to another YouTube short. Get them addicted to you in short form, and maybe, just maybe, they'll want more of you because they stop watching other short-form people and they watch you more. So give people what they want. If they found you with a short, Move them to another short and another one and another one and another one. And then on their homepage, maybe when you, they start seeing the long form videos from you, maybe they'll click on them on the homepage. I do not think that you should try to use YouTube shorts to get them to watch long form videos while they're trying to watch shorts. Let the algorithm decide to show them your long form videos based on their patterns. And then they'll decide on their own if they want to watch long form from you. Remember, Tactics are for amateurs, strategy is for professionals, and psychology is for masters. I teach psychology. I will still teach you strategy. I will still teach you tactics. I will still teach you tactics. Now, the thing is, tactics also work in the short form. Tactics work for people who want to go viral. Strategy works for people who want to go viral. And psychology works for people who want to go viral. It's a matter of how quickly. But the thing is, what you get quickly, you also can lose quickly. So I play long games. Frosty, the Game Slayer, says, Roberto, I've been working on getting better at my editing and making better thumbnails. I find it's really hard. Uh, it should be. When you're trying to um, cultivate attention from people, I think it should be hard, and I think it's going to get harder over time. But I'm okay with that because I think that if you're going to ask people for their time, you should make it worth their while. I've asked all of you. There are almost 600 of you watching live right now. Uh, you've given me two hours and change of your time. It's my responsibility to make that worthwhile, and that should be hard. Uh, the lady who writes says, Roberto, our vlog channel is worth the effort. Um, I actually went over this and explained a couple of minutes ago exactly how they can be worth it and what my thoughts are on it. And um, I think that I answered that. Um, the lady writes says, I've been in my passion business for the last 10 years. I'm expanding options. And I don't want to duplicate what other authors are doing on YouTube. Okay, so if your thing is writing and you, because I don't know if you want to make a vlog as a writer and that was what you were thinking of because you're passionate about your business. Because I don't know that that lends itself to a vlogging channel per se but you might like the aesthetic and the look and feel of a vlog. There might be a way to get a behind the business lifestyle entrepreneurship, like hustler lifestyle, or if it's more laid back, you know, some kind of like, you know, laid back lady who writes lady back, um, lady boss, like channel, some laid back lifestyle. There might be some lifestyle angle you could use there, but it might be 
the life and times of a entrepreneur maybe in some way. So there's a, there's a potential strategy there. I would need more details to know what the aesthetic would be to figure out who the audience avatar is, what their age, what their aspirations are and how to make that an aspiration based channel. Um, but there's a way to do it and it could look very much like the, uh, aesthetic lifestyle vlog of a productivity person because a writer also would lend itself to maybe being both creative and productive. And there's interesting ways to approach that cinematically with storytelling. So there's a lot that can be done there. It's actually really interesting to explore that. Uh, Shonen Showdown. Thank you. Uh, actually successful client here. Uh, appreciate your advice, bro. Our talk to help a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shonen, uh, Shonen Showdown. Yeah, no, another, um, you know, great creator. I actually really like the anime niche a lot. I'm an anime fan, as many of you know, but it is hard to monetize if you um, don't think a little bit outside the box because the problem is the limitations of using someone else's internet uh, intellectual property. You run into the same problem with gaming. You run into the same problem with reaction and with uh, TV and uh, movie reviews, but it can be done. It's just like you have to think a little bit out of the box and you also have to build the business model just right. Adventures with um, Bob Gens says, uh, Roberto, what do you think about travel vloggers? Any tips for that niche? Again, travel channel, lifestyle channel, cinematics for that. Think TV show. Think TV show. YouTube is the new television. Think YouTube's new television show. Travel vlogging is a reality TV show. Travel, travel vlogging is a reality TV show. And you should stop thinking about YouTube videos and you should start thinking in series and you shouldn't think about YouTube. You should be platform agnostic and you should be posting, you should be making a travel brand. You shouldn't be a travel vlogger. You're a travel brand. You're not a travel vlogger. You're not a YouTuber. You're a travel brand. You're an adventure brand. You're an outdoors brand. Okay. So now that's different. That's different. Okay, so now you're multi-platform. Now you're multi-platform. Now this is a travel brand that lives on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, and X.com, formerly Twitter, probably even Facebook, all right, maybe even Snapchat. And so now you're a multi-platform travel brand that has multiple affiliate links for all of the products associated with your travel, has sponsors, including hotel sponsors, um, sponsors for transportation, like flights, buses, uh, uh, cruise ship, whatever it is, um, boating, whatever it is, expedition, um, travel booking. In terms of the travel booking, you have a booking sponsor. You have a, you know, oh, all of our accommodations go through Expedia.com and da, 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 something like that. Okay. Um, you have sponsors in terms of possibly clothing. You have a, a merch line that's about the outdoor adventure, if that's what you're doing. You have um, products you've done a partnership with brands where you get a royalty forever on the product, where you've co-branded a product that makes the uh, traveler's life easier. You are making your own branded travel guides under your brand imprint as a publisher for everywhere that you visited around the world. You see what I'm saying? You're a travel brand. You're not a travel blog. You're not a travel vlog. You're a travel brand. You see what I'm saying? That's my tips for the niche. This is why, again, this is why I would recommend coaching and working with me. Like if you want to work with me, I do offer uh, coaching. Check out my coaching options. Link is in the chat. Should also be in the description of the video. Um, if it's not, I'm at it there now for you. Um, so let's see. Work with me one on one. There we go. I've saved that in the description for anybody who wants to refresh. It's also in the live chat. But yeah. Adventures with the Boggins, you are not a travel vlog anymore. 
you are a travel brand. You should be on every platform that monetizes and pays creators. You should have a list of 100 brands that you want to reach out to that are related to travel and all things travel related from everything from the accommodations, the hotels, the flights, the buses, the boats, the uh, cruises, um, clothing, outerwear, everything. And you'll narrow that 100 brands down to 20 you actually like. And you'll do different categories for exclusivity, and you'll work out those brand deals. You'll have several affiliate links, but you'll especially use Amazon, globally Amazon. And you're going to track those links with Genius Link. And those are like those are just some of the things off the top of my head you're going to start with because you are not a travel vlogger. You are a travel brand. And yeah, you're going to make your own travel guides. And you're going to sell them on Amazon and get bestseller in Amazon and get all these ratings and make royalties forever for the rest of your life. And that's... That's the business model. And, you know, if you, you know, it's something we can discuss. The Divine Chef says, hey, Roberto, um, I want to say you've blessed me uh, with my channel so much. I truly appreciate all that you share. Thank you. Appreciate you. Uh, the lady writes five dollars super chat. Thank you, thank you so much, Roberto. I love this idea. I'm an offer, and that's different from what others are doing. So perfect. Thank you. Yeah, for you, there. Um, I think you could definitely do a lifestyle brand, and that could be um, like you know, very much following the life and the lifestyle things. I think there's a lot there. Um, for inspiration to some degree of vlog like content for professionals, you could look at my friend Lavender. Um, now she does how to content a lot, but I'm saying aesthetically, you could take a lot of inspiration from her. Frosty, the game slayer says, Roberto, do you have any advice for a gaming channel? Uh, I've got plenty of advice for gaming channels. I gave an entire business model for gaming channels. And I said, it's the same as the business model for reaction and anime channels. So be more specific about the advice there. But for monetization advice, it's the same advice I gave for reaction channels and the same advice I gave for anime channels. Because anime, gaming, television, and movie reviews are all the same channel because they're all covering someone else's intellectual property. There are nuances that change, but not in the business sense. In the business sense, all five of y'all are lumped together. You have the same business model with minor tweaks because you're using someone else's intellectual property that's vulnerable to copyright. So the business model, the content strategy is slightly different, but this is monetization Monday. This is about the money. The way you make your money, the five of you all do basically the same thing to make your money because it's the only way to really do it because of copyright. Um, trying uh, to trying, to, I think it's trying to quit. Um, says, yeah, I've done that too, honestly. Either views or subs to get me to pay attention. Yeah, that's pre-selection bias. So pre-selection bias means that you're um, paying attention based on this um, bias that is a very subconscious bias on status. Um, so that could be status such as, oh, I see money, or I see a high subscriber count, or I see... A uh, gold or silver play button in a thumbnail, or I see something is viral and has a bunch of views. So it's pre selection bias off of in group behavior or off of community vetting, um, you know, very much popularity contest of, oh, everybody's going there. So I guess I'll do it too. Or everybody's doing that. So I guess I'll do it too. Or everyone's watching that. So I guess it's too, too. Hey, everybody says that's popular. So I guess it is. But a lot of times that's also a mistake because there are some trash people that you like, why is this popular? And you're mad and you're like, oh, but like, Okay, but you overlooked 20 people who were more deserving, and why? Because that thing stood out because popularity, views, and subscribers. How many garbage human beings are famous that you that you click on and then you immediately regret it, and then do you go back and look at one of those other people you overlooked, and then do you realize, oh, wait, I should stop going off of what is popular because there's a lot of low – frequency lowbrow people who are making scumbags famous like okay lesson learned 
stop following the crowd because the crowd is stupid. Like, right? So, like, that's a thing. Sometimes that's a thing. Now, for us content creators, knowing that people are low frequency and that low hanging fruit works, sometimes what you see, and I hate this because a bunch of people lose credibility doing this, is that's why if you're wondering why clickbait happens, if you're wondering why so many creators you love and you get annoyed by the fact, oh, they're resorting to clickbait, it's because of pre-selection bias. It's because of pre-selection bias because it's the only way that they can get through the filter of people having shiny object syndrome and people being distracted by in-group behavior and saying, well, if everybody's paying attention to this, I guess I have to as well. That's why YouTube feels like um, it's clickbait on steroids now, even from education channels, even from channels who used to give great information, be science driven, or used to do uh, great uh, stats stuff, finance stuff, science, finance, all this stuff. You have it watered down and it's getting popular because why? They're chasing younger and younger and younger and dumber and dumber people because they're the largest group of people. And because pre-selection bias says, hey, if a bunch of people are looking at this, it must be more credible. But it's often the opposite. It's often the opposite because wisdom is the minority. Wisdom and knowledge of the minority. And so instinctively, when people follow mass group psychology, well, what are the majority of people? The majority of people are poor. Well, not poor, but broke maybe, or broke or, you know, not doing great. The majority of people are doing well, the majority of people actually technically are at the median, but the median could still feel like a struggle bus. And, you know, usually there are more people that are broke or poor than are wildly, wildly successful. So that means that, wait a minute, following the logic of the masses probably won't serve me well. But when we're looking for something to waste time on and spend entertainment on, we're not thinking about it too much. But the thing is, most of what's popular is completely useless, but it is entertaining. So it, if you're looking for something just on pure entertainment, no harm, no foul on looking at what's popular and having shiny object syndrome. The problem is we don't code switch our behavior from entertainment when it's time to do things that are important like news or finance, health and fitness, lifestyle, relationships, money. We don't code switch from our entertainment mode on YouTube when it comes to this pre-selection bias that we have, and therefore we look overlook really valuable information and very credible people or some of the best creators or best personalities or some of the sweetest people or nicest people we could be making famous and could be um, supporting. We all do this, myself included sometimes. We overlook them because other people didn't give them attention, so we think they're beneath our notice. And that's where we also bear some responsibility as a community for the fact that we've made a lot of terrible people a lot of money and we've made a lot of terrible people famous because we can't help our lowbrow instinct of following what other people made popular, which is catering to the lowest dom common denominator. It's catering to the least educated person. And the thing is we don't code switch between our vapid entertainment versus um, when something actually matters, who we give our attention to. So even people who are supposed to inform us with news, education, uh, things that affect our health, even they are becoming sensational, are becoming sensational, outlandish, lowbrow, diluting their value, and manipulating our emotions and manipulating our emotions. Why? Pre-selection bias. And therefore, what is popular is not always good, and what is good is not always popular. So the thing is, sometimes we have to compete, though, on emotion, which is why I would tell you, from a thumbnail strategy standpoint, your thumbnails and titles should make an appeal to emotion, even if you do intellectual content. And so it should have some emotional trigger, some psychological emotional trigger to bypass um, people's appeal to logic and go directly for the emotions because you're competing with everyone else on that anyway. You're competing with that, and logic will never, for most people, instinctively beat emotion. So appeal to emotion in your titles and thumbnails as a strategy or as a tactic. That makes sense, and that's why we have clickbait. My only ask of you is that you don't abuse your audience with this, and that if you go and you do that, you don't emotionally manipulate them, and you actually deliver on value, and you actually engage with them, and you reply to their comments, and you're thoughtful, and you take responsibility for what you put out as a content creator. That would be my only ask, because then you're at least being 
honest and ethical and earnest, at least from my point of view. And the only thing you did was you did everything it took to get attention, but you became someone deserving of the attention that you got. And that's my only ask. That's if you're going to resort to packaging that is sensational or leverages emotion because you have to, to get attention in the marketplace. My only ask is that you actually be worthy and deserving of the attention you get with the value that you deliver and with the relationship you build with your audience and that they can actually trust you and not regret it. That would be the thing that I would ask. What I don't always love is that people will take my tactics, but not adopt my philosophy. <laughs> so uh, Magic Mitch says, uh, question, Roberto, what are the benefits for brand deals? Are there uh, for Academy Pro members? Also, where can I reach out to ask someone about membership, interest in mentoring or guidance, becoming a full-time creator? I think there are a couple of Academy members or people who've done one-on-one -on -one coaching here in the chat. Um, I don't know if they're still here. Um, you can reach out directly to me in Twitter, formerly well, x.com, formerly Twitter, at Roberto Blake. And you can I can answer any of your questions, Mitch, if you hit me up in DMs on Twitter. My DMs are open. The... Uh, other thing you can do is we do have over 70 trust pilot reviews uh, from people that have done academy membership and one-on-one -on -one coaching. And you can at, uh, look at the trust pilot reviews. A lot of them are also publicly verified creators. So you'd be able to look them up on social media and ask them directly about their experience. And they're not paid to say nice things in any way. They've done the reviews on their own. Trust pilot's pretty good with that. But the main thing is, yeah, people can fake reviews in Trustpilot, but the good news about content creators is these are public figures, so you can look them up and you can talk to them and DM them privately and ask them questions, and that's the value. You can also go to the Awesome Creator Academy website, and you can um, look at everything we have there. There's also frequently asked questions, and like I said, I'm happy to answer any questions you have in DMs. So the benefits for people looking for brand deals information is you can talk to me and Andy Rivera. She is my co-instructor and my operations manager. You can talk to us twice a week during office hours in the Awesome Creator Academy Pro Group, Tuesdays and Thursdays, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's why I do these live streams Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as I do coaching on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So we do the office hour sessions and you can talk to us directly about your brand deals. We can do hot seats and sometimes we do role play for people about their brand deals. You can ask us questions about things you don't understand in your uh, brand deals negotiation. And we also have other Academy members who are, some of them are full-time, some of them are part-time, some of them are UGC, some of them do long-term deals. We have multiple Academy members. I think we have currently 90 Academy members that you can um, talk to in the group, in the private group, and they can also give you some of their perspective and feedback and experience. And a lot of them straight up tell you, hey, you're charging too low. We also have um, what I call the accountability club, which is a chat group. We have a, a direct messenger chat group where people hold each other accountable on their goals and support each other. And so a lot of them, they like to do that in the mornings. And so that's the DM group as well. So that would be one of the benefits with brand deals specifically, I think that because not only me, but a lot of the other creators are knowledgeable in the membership, that just having the different perspectives and getting on the live calls with us during office hours and us being able to go back and forth about your thing and getting more than one perspective, but at least having a perspective mine, experience perspective outside yourself, but also perspective from other people, even that are not me, um, to be able to um, share their experiences or talk you through things can be extremely valuable, the accountability side too. But also one thing that I think is also extremely helpful and motivating about being in a group of other creators is the fact that you have people taking it seriously like you who are doing the work and can show you what's possible. And I think because we do our um, winning Wednesday post or whenever people have wins, we celebrate them. 
there is an encouragement in seeing that other people are transforming. And so if other people are doing it, you can do. It's like when you go to the gym, right? When you start working out at a gym, I don't know how many of you are on a fitness journey. I think we probably all should be after four years of a pandemic being on a fitness journey now and lose our COVID 15 pounds. Um, I think that if you go on a fitness journey, right, you can work out at home by yourself for free for zero dollars. But when you go to the gym, the good news is you're seeing people show up in the gym and then you want to show up. You're able to talk to people uh, about like what their program is, what their diet is, what the machine is. And then you start thinking, getting ideas for yourself and getting motivated and getting pumped. Sometimes you get a gym buddy and you're like, yeah, let's go. Like me and my brother, we go to the gym together. And so it, it, um, also makes you be like, yeah, it's like, okay, and let's make our, like, hey, let's do this new um, protein shake recipe. Let's try something different. Or, hey, um, let's try um, doing a different set of machines today. Let's just try it. Or, hey, I saw this person do this. Let's go talk to them and ask them about what they're doing. and what. So, like, the there's a difference between when I, what I found is it's easier when you have an accountability partner to be consistent in something that works long enough for it to actually show results. Number two um accountability partners besides mentors accountability partners are sometimes as good or better than mentors because you feel like you're in it together sometimes you need camaraderie much more than you need leadership i think leadership is important but i think camaraderie is either a close second and depending on where you are in your journey actually more important sometimes because i think that leadership is good to know what to do camaraderie means you'll keep doing it so i think that that's important i think support and camaraderie and community and accountability matter more. I don't think a mentor always is enough to hold you accountable. I think you need comrades. And there's a lot of ways to approach that one. Um, I think the most fortunate people are people who do content creation with their spouse or their significant other. I think the others are people who get to do it with their family because I think there's the built-in accountability, built-in community, built-in support, built-in camaraderie. I think outside of that, it's very isolating. And I think it's the same thing with like working out. I think it's the same thing with studying. When you're um, in school, one of the best things you can do is join a study group. Now, if you can have a tutor, if you can have a private tutor, that's great. Most people can't afford a private tutor, but being in a study group is really, really good. And kids who get to go to a cram school do really, really well, right? And I think that just is a, that shows you that this works throughout life. That shows you that throughout life, the thing that accelerates you a lot of times besides specific knowledge, besides having a mentor. The thing that really I think helps is having anyone outside of yourself to be able to interact with, talk to you, and to hold you accountable, keep you consistent, keep you motivated, keep you inspired, and to also put your feet to the fire sometimes and tell you, hey, don't do that or stop doing that or hey, why aren't you showing up? Or hey, you're you're not here, but we're showing up all the time. Where are you? Or hey, Stay on our level, get our level, keep going. I think that you stay much sharper and much more motivated. I think iron sharpens iron. And so when you're a kid or for any of you have kids or students, remember that if you can't afford a private tutor, encouraging your kid to do a study group or helping your kid put together a study group is a really, really good idea, right? And if you can afford it, private tutors or cram schools are really, really good. It will always be better than someone who's doing it alone because someone who's doing it alone and winning is already smart. Someone who's doing it alone and is already winning is already smart. Someone who's on a fitness journey who's doing it alone, doing it at home, going to the gym by themselves or doing it at home for free is probably already healthy, already fit, and already motivated and driven on their own, right? That's not true for most people. That's an outlier thing. That's an outlier thing. YouTube success is the same. It, a lone wolf that's successful and never needed any help, never needed a mentor, never needed guidance, never needed a tutorial, never needed a course. Now, that, that's really rare. And those people were already charismatic, already attractive, already smart, already going to be successful on their own, destined for greatness by virtue of a genetic lottery or something like that, right? Most people need each other and need somebody um, to support them and to hold them accountable and to encourage them or to inspire them or to just be there. That's most people. That's one of my experiences in life. That was one of my regrets in life was I did so many things solo, including YouTube for a very, very long time. And I didn't believe that there were people willing to help me besides, cause like, you know, I just had a hard time asking for help. That's why I said that humility is probably one of the most important things because you should be able to ask for help when you need it. And you get held back and held up by not asking for help. And there were people who were willing to help me. I was not willing to ask. 
And that was a mistake on my part. I would be much more successful, much bigger if earlier in my career, I knew how to ask for help and believe that there were people willing to help me. That was on me. And that was like negative beliefs and what have you, right? So for most of you, whether it's, again, the Academy Pro Group or something else you do, you should find people. And for a lot of you, what sucks is your family doesn't support what you're doing because they think it's weird, right? But um, thankfully, my family was emotionally supportive. And then later when I could afford to hire them, they were physically supportive. Um, but what I would say is, um, that's something everyone needs. It's isolating. I think most people quit YouTube and get give up and get discouraged because they have nobody that believes in them and they have nobody to support them. They have nobody to say, hey, I'll hold a camera for you today so you can get that extra shot, right? Or, hey, um, good job. Uh, keep going. Like People just do not have that. And they need to keep going for like three years, five years, seven years to be successful. That's really hard when no one is showing up for you like in the way that you want them to or the way you need them to. And I think that however people come by that, that will probably be the thing that they can solve that will call, like create a situation where they can endure all the bad days of content creation, like the, the sucky negative, the, like the one out of 100 negative comment is easier when there's not just 100 good comments, but when there's someone in life that is just texting you or DMing you or in real life can tell you good job, that matters quite a bit. Or when you do get stuck, the fact that there's someone who you can just ask a question, like one of the things I still like about in-person learning, right? In-person learning or even virtual learning, the thing that I like is, hey, I'm stuck on this thing. I have a question and being able to get an answer the same day, that matters. And that's why I think that in-person learning or at least online, but um, live, live online learning, virtual learning, virtual classrooms. in person's probably still the best thing. Virtual is the next best thing. Um, I think cohorts, communities, things like that, probably the best because then you can have multiple answers, multiple perspectives. I think the next best substitute is things like Discord servers, maybe to a degree. Um, probably the next best thing. Maybe Twitter after that, maybe. But I think that that feedback mechanism, I think the feedback mechanism, I think the support mechanism, I think accountability, I think feedback, support, and accountability are the three hardest things to do on your own. And I think that because people lack that, they quit YouTube. They either quit YouTube, they don't do it long enough, they're not patient enough, and then they never, ever, uh, excuse me, they never, ever break through. And I think that quitting early is largely what jacks people up. Like, I think that they quit too soon because I'll give you an example. Most of you have never heard this. Most of you don't know this. It took Mr. Beast 460 videos. And this is absolutely true because I watched his 10,000 subscriber special. It took Mr. Beast 460 uploads to YouTube to get to 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. And he spent um, three years just getting to 1,000 subscribers. He did 100 videos and only had 800 subscribers to show for it. And I think it was his second or third YouTube channel. It was his second and third attempt. And he struggled bust for like three years to get to, like, I think it was 1,000 or 2,000 subscribers for three years. He had to upload... 460 videos to get to 10,000 subscribers. And I don't think he got to 100,000 subscribers until he uploaded roughly 600 videos. Now, they've been going back and deleting and privating some of his old videos. Most of them are still up. So you can't just count it manually yourself. You have to watch his 10,000 subscribers special. And you have to watch his like 50,000 subscriber special Q&A. And you have to watch his like 100K subscriber video to know those stats. You, to know those stats. But since most people don't know that, they don't know that Mr. Beast like spent from age 12 to age 19, like eight long years to finally get a silver play button and become a big YouTuber, like the beginnings, the, the smallest version of being a big YouTuber, silver play button. It took him that long.
It took him that long. And yes, he blew up from 100K to a million relatively quickly after the fact, but that was eight years of grinding. It was eight years of grinding and being small. And he's only 25. He was a small YouTuber longer than he's been a bigger YouTuber. Still. So like that was half of his life span, I think. Like he spent half of his life on YouTube and of the half of his life they spent on YouTube, majority of it was struggling and not getting anywhere. Eight years to get a silver play button, y'all. Would you would, like? I don't know that most people have that in them. I don't think most people have them that in them. Mr. Beast got his silver play button the same year I got mine, by the way, 2016. 2016. Mr. Beast got his silver play button in July of 2016, or rather, he got 100, he got 100,000 subscribers. His silver play button arrived probably two months later, but we got the numbers. Like, I hit like 100K in I think April or May. And then I got my play button in like June or July or something. It takes a while. And then Mr. Beast got his 100K in July. And then he gets his play button in like August or whatever. So like we got our 100K uh, play buttons in the same year, relative same time. Now, I think we uploaded almost the same amount of videos to do it too. I think we uploaded like, well, no, he might have uploaded like 500, 600 videos like 550, 600 videos, I have to check again. I uploaded like 800 videos to get my silver play button, but I did 800 videos over the course of three years. Now I started my YouTube channel in 2009, but I wasn't uploading. I spent four years not doing anything with my channel. I only started doing something consistently in 2013. So therein lies the difference. But yeah, we got our uh, play buttons both in 2016. And look where he is now. But he grinded... For eight years. I don't know that he could have done that. If his mother wasn't supportive. If his friends. Weren't supportive. Most people didn't get it. He was bullied in his high school for it. I think it was really hard for him. I think it was really hard for him. He's the most successful YouTuber now. But it was really hard for him. He didn't really know. He knew he wanted it more than anyone else. There were times he definitely was going to give up. And I, I don't think y'all have heard that story before. I don't think y'all heard the story. I know all of you aren't super into Mr. Beast. I just think it's an inspirational story. I just think that a lot of people don't realize that the average number of uploads to succeed at YouTube is n like 500 to 1,000 uploads. It's 500 to 1,000 uploads to make it. And that's just to get a silver play button. That's not even to get a gold play button and a million subscribers. Now, YouTube Shorts skews that now. I'm talking about before YouTube Shorts. I'm talking about before YouTube Shorts. That's what it took. So just a nice story for you all to help you understand like how hard it is and what it takes and how long you have to fight and grind if you're not doing YouTube Shorts uh, to get this. So Dale Danielle ask, uh Question, Roberto, how would you create a hybrid channel on NBA 2K, but mixed with my own created players and storytelling influenced by X-Men? How would you try and make money with your own character and stories? I think you're literally asking nearly the impossible. I, I think that way, how would Roberto do it? I probably wouldn't be obsessed with trying to tie it to an influence from X-Men or whatever. I'm just going to tell you in general how I'd approach NBA 2K channel, which is very similar to how I'd approach a gaming channel in general, is I'd be doing YouTube Shorts content. I'd be uploading probably three YouTube Shorts a day. I'd be probably uploading three YouTube Shorts a day. And to be honest with you, if I'm uploading three YouTube Shorts a day and I'm doing NBA 2K content, I'd probably be doing vertical live streaming twice a week. And then regular widescreen live streaming once a week. Um, and I'd probably be uploading two videos a week to the channel. And that sounds insane. It sounds insane. But I need to basically be making 100 shorts a month, 100 live streams a year, and 100 regular videos a year. And that's why I'd be doing that.
and I know that sounds insane, but that would be my maximum optimization of a hybrid channel. It sounds radical, but that's how I'd break out. That's how I'd break out because no one's willing to do that. Like no one's willing to do that. But I also would get a learning curve that's better than almost anyone else. I'd get a learning curve that's better than anyone else. And I believe that doing that for like three years straight would get to a silver play button, if not a gold play button in NBA 2K because NBA 2K has a massive audience. NBA, I just wouldn't be obsessed with the whole, oh, storytelling and making my original characters. I would not be doing that because I would just be making NBA. I would look at, here's what I would do. I'm being dead serious. I would scrap this whole storytelling thing and like that because that's a that's not a I want to be a successful YouTuber who does NBA 2K for a living. That's a I really want to be like I want to do this fun quirky thing and you know make money at it. It's like no, I would scrap the quirky I want to do storytelling with my original characters thing. No, what I would probably do, and I'm being dead serious here. I know I'm probably killing your dream, but I'm telling you what I would do. I'm probably killing your dream. Fine. I would research and find every NBA 2K video I possibly can that has 1 million to 10 million views ever on NBA 2K. And I wouldn't stop until I have the titles and thumbnails for 100 videos on NBA 2K that have over 1 million views. Then, based on all of those titles and thumbnails that have 1 million views, I would build a strategy on how can I one-up, improve, or make more extreme every single one of those videos, and I would make a hun- those 100 videos that are better, more extreme, more updated, um, take those things to the 10th degree that have a million views because I've proven demand. I've proven demand. I no longer have to guess what people want. I know exactly what they want and I can make a more extreme version of what they want. So I have a hundred videos, tiles and thumbnails and now I'm going to beat that got a million subscribers that won. Oh, I found a wit- something that won and I found 100 from different creators of what won. I'm now going to improve on that packaging and on that idea that already won and was already approved by the community because I now know exactly what they want, exactly what they want. Because then, then, if I get 10% of that proven market of success, I have 100,000 views on every upload. If I get 1% of that success as a new YouTuber, I get 10,000 views on every single one of those uploads, which would be a tremendous victory as a small YouTuber, as a small YouTuber. Or less than 10% of all videos in YouTube get 1,000, more than 1,000 views. 88% of videos never get 1,000 views. 88% of videos have never gotten, before YouTube Shorts, have never gotten 1,000 views on YouTube. So if I build my entire strategy on only improving video ideas and improving video thumbnails on videos in my niche, NBA 2K, that have always gotten a million views and I never make a video that hasn't been proven to get a million views. If I even get 1% of that success, I am pretty much guaranteed to get 10,000 views on every upload. If I get 10,000 views on every upload, that means in my first year, I got a million views. And that's on regular long form videos. Now then based on that, I then research every live stream YouTube replay of NBA 2K that within the last year has gotten at least 100,000 views on the live stream replay. And then I repeat this formula of, and that's how I'm going to approach my live streaming strategy as well. And I'm going to plan that and I'm going to do um, one to two weekly live streams. And then now I have to come up with shorts and the vertical video format. And so what am I going to do? I'm now going to research NBA 2K YouTube shorts and then find ones that have 10 million views until I find 100 video ideas with 10 million views. And then once I find that, 
I'm going to find a way to say, how do I turn each of those video ideas into a series, not just a video title? No, no, no. How do I get a series out of that? How do I get a series out of that? Because now I'm going to upload a hundred of those YouTube shorts that have 10 million proven views that I capitalized on and made a, a series around how to one up that idea. And I'm going to upload a hundred of those a month because that's insane. But I found the demand curve and now I'm massively inflating the supply. I'm inflating the supply of proven demand and I only need 1% of it to hit. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Are you feeling me? Are you picking up what I'm putting down? I will not, I would not build a strategy on an unproven idea to be original when I could literally just improve upon a proven demand that the audience wants and give them what they want in this particular case. Now, there's a difference. If I'm an education channel, this strategy I just gave you does not work for an education channel. This only works in an entertainment niche. This only works mostly in gaming. And gaming and other things like gaming, anime, like this works in gaming and anime. This strategy is really more for gaming and anime and will work. It's not really for education channels. That's why I can't do this in that mode Um, because those things also don't have wide appeal and blah, blah, blah. Like anyway, so this is lowest common denominator, but at scale because now I'm just, okay, here's the market. Here's the total addressable market. Here's what's in demand across the total addressable market. Here's the market cap. Now I just need to capitalize on that. Now I use the 1% rule. And if I use the 1% rule on this, I win disproportionately. And if I get 10%, I outlier one beyond my wildest dreams. And if I one-to-one this and do better than the original, oh, then I've killed it. And so whatever. So like this would be how if I did an NBA 2K channel, this exact strategy and grinding that this out for three years and only doing this, no matter how much I wish I was doing something original and doing the thing and making my own storyline, if I do this and don't, do my own storyline and do something purely original. This basically almost guarantees this strategy that I get a silver or gold play button in three years. And then I'm a full-time content creator in three years. So how would I do a hybrid NBA 2K channel? I would do exactly this. This is why people hire me as a coach. I would do exactly this and only this. And that would be my strategy. I think that people overthink originality instead of looking at what do people want how do i now identify demand and now how do i inflate the supply youtube is just market like youtube is just a, um, the same thesis as overall supply and demand economics it's the same idea because the only difference is now the product is whatever gets attention <clears throat> how do we find our niche? I have various different types of content to my channel. You need to narrow in on what you are good at. You're right. So you have to be passionate about something, but you have to be passionate about something and also good at it. If you love the thing, but suck, that doesn't work. So if you love it and you suck, it doesn't work. This thing also has to have a proven business model where you know how to make money at it and that it does make money or you're going to be poor, which means no matter how much you love it and how good you're at it, you can't be validated or respected because people are not respecting you with their dollars for time. So you're not being rewarded, which means eventually you'll resent it. You run out of passion and then you're also not being rewarded for skill, which then affects your self-esteem. So that's bad. But there also has to be a demand in the market for it. People have to need it, want it, love it. So the thing is, it does have to cater to what people love and want and also what they can pay for and will pay for and will afford. So it has to have the external factors of it has to be profitable and has to have a large enough market and demand in the market. So it has to have a total addressable market. Um, It has to have a business model and profit center. You have to be passionate enough to be consistent and love it even when it's not rewarding. And you have to be able to attract a tribe of people in the market demand that love it like you do, but then you have to create value for them so that you're not, um, you know, losing them because, okay, I love this thing. You love this thing, but Hey, you suck at this thing. That doesn't work. That doesn't help anyone. Cause then you didn't create any value, but then that value has to be rewarded and validated, not just with eyeballs, but with dollars, because then you cannot sustain doing it. 
nor can you sustain passion for it because you can't live off of passion. You can't take it to the bank. You can't eat food with it. You can't pay your bills with it. You can't buy equipment with it. So it has to be passionate and profitable and you have to be good at it and people have to want it or need it. So it's Ikigai, which is the intersectionality of passion, skill, which I call that part ability. And then we have market fit, which is um, monetization and market demand. So monetization, what people can pay for and how you can monetize it and what they will pay for and why they'll pay for it. Market demand, big enough market of people who want this and will pay for it, okay? But then you actually need ability, which is I'm passionate about this, so I will get good at it and I'll keep doing it. So I'll be passionate about it, but I'm skilled enough at it to where me being passionate about it matters and I can become better and I will do it until better and do it until it pays and do it um, for people like me. So that's why you need the intersectionality. You need the internal world of your ability. My passion meets my skill set. Then you need the external world of market fit. There's a market demand for it and it is profitable. And I know how to profit from it. So ability plus market fit equals niche. I'm passionate and skilled. If I'm passionate and I suck, move on, scrap it. If I'm good at it, but I hate it, scrap it, move on. But it also has to be, you can make money doing this and I know that that's enough money to satisfy me and to sustain me and for me to be able to invest and grow. And there has to be enough market demand and market fit of people I'm aligned with so I won't resent my audience or my customers. And they have to be able to afford me. And we have to like the same thing so I don't resent them and they don't resent me. And I have to be skilled enough to deliver value for them on their terms. So that's why you need all four. You need all four. If something does not cross the intersectionality of I'm passionate about it, I'm good at it. I know I can make money with it and how to make the money with it. And there's a big enough audience that is aligned with me and can make this profitable and satisfy my ego by enough people caring. If it cannot meet all of those requirements, you move on until you find what does. That is how you find your niche. We did an entire stream about finding your niche, identifying your audience avatar, qualifying this, qualifying your ideas. We've actually done a live stream about it. You can find it here on the channel under the live streams. We have a bunch of ones scheduled for the next month through April. We have almost all the live streams except for some of the workshops scheduled through April. So what we do is monetization Mondays, workshop Wednesdays. So monetization, how do we do business on YouTube? How do we make money as a content creator? How do we make money on YouTube, x.com, email list? How do we make our money? So monetization Mondays, then we have workshop Wednesdays. How do we use the skills we need? So how do we design and make our merch? How do we build a course? How do we make our thumbnails? How do we do this video editing thing? How do we do sound design? So it's workshop Wednesdays and then it's FAQ Fridays. Hey, I need some strategy. I need some tips. I need some help. I have some questions, blah, 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 blah. So, oh, analytics, da, 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 da. So like, so that's the, that's the game plan right now. That's the game plan right now. But and why? Because that's how you're going to address the things I just said. We're going to increase your skills. A lot of you, deep down, you already know what you're passionate about, but you don't know how to make money. A lot of you, you're not skilled enough to pull off your passion. And a lot of you have questions uh, about your market and your market fit. You don't know who your audience actually is or how to understand them. And you need training and analytics. You need to ask questions. You need content strategy. You don't know how to deliver. So, you know, obviously that's where FAQ Fridays comes in is strategy and uh, idea generation and development and a lot of those things and any questions you might have. But that's kind of how I figured out the themes for the live streams is for that reason. Um. All is calm, uh, cryptos and relax has a question. Roberto, my channel is only live streams. Any advice on getting brand deals with live streams? Seems like companies only want to do video ads. Also, do you still have Li-Fi? Rebrand your live streams as a podcast. Brands love podcasts. Rebrand your live streams to a podcast and then you'll do that. Uh, my Lo-Fi channel still exists, but I haven't been uploading to it for a very, 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 very long time. I actually have 30 unreleased songs for my Lo-Fi channel. I've just been focused on Everything else, to be honest with you, I do want to keep doing it. I actually do also want to set up, finish setting up the back end website so people can download those since they can use them um, 
you know, um, royalty free and not get copyright strikes. So the thing is, the goal was for us to uh, unleash 100 of these royalty free songs so you don't have to worry about copyright strikes and make it so people can download them. I have to finish doing all the licensing and back end on DistroKid for that. We have over 30 unreleased songs that I haven't put up yet. And so eventually I'll get back to the lo-fi channel eventually when I clear a lot of my sponsored content stuff off my plate, when I have other things uh, squared away, we'll do that. I also have to fix the 24 hour stream with Obubble and fix my virtual server so that it can run the 24 hour radio um, live radio thing uh, and do that. Once I get those things worked out, the lo-fi channel, it's still up. It'll just be, it's not my first priority, second priority or third priority right now. I also have to get some other stuff done with my podcast because I have like five interviews that haven't been edited. Um, so I need to do that. I need to unleash those um, interviews. And like I said, we have 30 songs that I, my ghost producers made that I haven't um, released yet. And we want to make sure that we handle distro kids so that people can use those without copyright strikes, stuff like that. But the lo-fi channel still exists. People can still check out Zen Buster music um, as my lo-fi channel. Give it a listen, throw it on in the background while you're doing your work sessions. That's great. Um, that channel, if enough of you listen to it, it'll eventually just get monetized. Uh, we were so close to monetization so many times. In fact, we would have qualified under the old rules. We would have qualified. We had over 3,000 watch hours. We would have qualified under the old rules three different times um, because we always were able to get 3,000 subs, but not not by the time they changed the rules to where you get monetized with 3,000 subs, we would have got monetized already. So um, that kind of sucks, but yeah. Uh, the Divine Chef $10 Super Chat says, I just hit 13,000 subscribers and I have companies sending me emails to share their brand and product. Is it fair for me to ask for money instead of just getting products? How do I go about it? Uh, you ask, you, di you directly ask and say, um, hey, I would love to do some work with you. Um, what do you have in the budget for sponsored content? That's how you would ask and go about that. Now, if they're giving away product, then if you're at like 13,000, it's not gonna be a ton of money, but it should be something. Maybe it'll be something in like the 300 to $500 range plus product, which could be pretty okay. And as a small YouTuber, that might be more than you're making a month off of AdSense. So that's what you could expect. I'm not saying that that's fair because I don't know what the deal is. I don't know what the terms of the contract are, but I'm saying that's what around what you would expect. Here's the thing. I'm not worried about saturation in YouTube, and I actually have a great slide about this. Let me open up my slides. Uh, at least I think I have. Do I have the slide that I think I do about this? Um, I don't think I have the slide with the stats about this because I think we... Maybe I do. Let me check. Because um, I have a bunch of slides do i have the slide with the youtube stats um let me see let me see if i have this other slide because there's a slide with my vid summit presentation and if i have that one then it has the slide um that actually shows that YouTube isn't saturated. Um, the problem is, 
Nope, that's not the one. Okay. Hmm. Let me see if I can find it. Um, I may not have it on this machine, which sucks because I'll I'll do it another time then. But there's this slide that I normally have um, in a lot of my presentations. YouTube is not saturated. And I'll tell you why. YouTube is saturated with very, very low quality, low effort content with low value from inconsistent creators, which is why 88% of all videos that are not YouTube shorts that have ever been uploaded to the platform, according to 9to5google.com in a long form case study, have less than 1,000 views on YouTube. Less than 10% of videos have between 1,000 and 10,000 views on YouTube. Less, less than one, like about 1% 1 of videos have between 10,000 and 100,000 views. Less than 1% have over 1,000 views. Oh, sorry, 100,000 views. Less than 1% of videos have over 100,000 views on YouTube. If you've ever gotten that, congratulations. This does not count YouTube shorts. This is long form videos. So videos and live streams. And less than half a percent have a million views on YouTube. I think it's less than 0.2%, okay? So that means that YouTube is saturated with crappy videos because the overwhelming amount of people are beginners, amateurs, don't know what to make, aren't trying to satisfy an audience. They're trying to satisfy their own ego by making whatever the hell they want, regardless of what people want to watch. What you want to make has nothing to do with what people want to watch. Not typically. Less than 1% of people are actually making what people want to watch. There are 100 million channels in YouTube in the world. Only 3 million of them are in the YouTube Partner Program, according to YouTube CEO Neil Mohan. As of 2024, February 2024, there are 3 million YouTube partners. There are 100 million YouTube channels in the world. Oh, Roberto, that's not active channels. Fine. Social Blade tracks 67 million active channels in the world. Therefore, there's either 3% of channels are monetized or or only 6% of channels are modern pies. Take your pick, it's still less than 10%. Therefore, if less than 10% of the platform, meaning 3% or 6% of the platform is monetized, then it's not saturated with anyone you need to be worrying about competing with. Because why are you worried about competing with channels that aren't even monetized? Then, that's out of everyone in the entire world. There are less than 1 million channels in the entire world that have YouTube play buttons. There are approximately 544,000, uh, 544,000, uh, 554,000 global channels worldwide have a silver play button in YouTube. The number of United States channels that have a silver play button in YouTube is less than about 66,000 as of February 2024. That includes YouTube Shorts channels, which are inflating the numbers because it was much less than that three years ago. Less Three years ago, it was much less than that. Three years ago, it wasn't even 40,000. YouTube Shorts was inflating the number. So there are less than 66,000 YouTube silver play buttons in the entire United States of America. The United States of America has the second largest amount of overall play buttons in the world. The first is India. The first is India. There are just a little over half a million play buttons in the world, which means it's less than 1% of all creators on the platform have a play button. The number of people in the United States of America with gold play buttons, I believe is still less than 6,000. If it is, it's a little over 6,000, but less than 7,000. I think I'd have to double check again for the United States of America numbers. I'd have to check again. Um, let's see, I am ranked number one for um, how many YouTube channels have a million subscribers in Google. So how many YouTube channels have a million, which will go to my own website, uh, channels uh, how many YouTube channels have 1 million subscribers? AwesomeCreatorAcademy.com article. So um, let me see. Yeah. Um, so about um, the numbers as of roughly um, 2024 are, uh, let's see. 
Let's see. Yep, 3 million channels monetized as of 2024. Uh, 90% of channels never get to 10,000 subscribers. Um, about 65,000 or less channels have 100,000 subscribers, silver play button. Less than 55,000 uh, 55, channels uh, globally have um, a million subscribers. So 65,000 channels in the US. 65,000 channels in the US have a silver play button. 55,000 globally have a play button, okay? Um, less than 1,800 channels in the world have 10 million subscribers and a diamond play button. 70% um, of YouTube traffic is from mobile devices. 70% plus of YouTube traffic is non-English, non-US speaking, not, sorry, non-English speaking, non-US channels. Um, nine channels as of spring 2024 have 100 million subscribers. Less than 550,000 channels in the entire world have play buttons currently. So YouTube isn't saturated by anything other than creators that can't get an audience. YouTube is only saturated with creators who can't get an audience. In the entire world, it's about half a million people that you're competing with just to get to silver play button. But if you are English speaking and you live in the United States, it's only about 65,000 people that you're competing with across all niches in the US that again, for English speaking channels. So that means that in the US across 65,000 silver play button level channels, because why would you compete with people who have less than a hundred? Why would you set your standard of competition to someone who hasn't gotten? And why would you worry about competing with someone who hasn't gotten a hundred thousand subscribers? Why would your standard be anything less than the standard of what is a 100,000 subscriber channel look like? And how do I close the gap of looking like someone who deserves a hundred thousand subscribers by looking at who already has that? This is why my thesis was, if you're doing entertainment based content, look for videos that get a million views or 10 million views, and then try to, how do I do better than that? Right? And I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Now you can be more modest than that if it doesn't like if you're not trying to be full time or it doesn't matter to you. It's just you're just doing it for fun. You can be much more modest and humble than that. That doesn't matter. But if you're talking about competing and you're worried about being saturated, it's not saturated. It's only saturated when you compete with the 99%. Why not just compete with the 1%? If you don't want to deal with saturation, never have a standard that matches the 99% ignore them and don't compete with them and never put yourself in the same category as the 99%. Skip ahead and make your standard when you wake up every morning. When you wake up every morning, get your behind into the hyperbolic time chamber, Dragon Ball Z reference, anime reference, go into the hyperbolic time chamber, walk yourself into hell and don't walk out until you're the 1%. And by being the 1%, I don't mean their results. I mean their standards, not their results, their standards. If you have standards of the 99%, you will be the 99%. This is true in athletics. This is true in academia. This is true in business. And it's true in YouTube. If you ignore what the 99% are doing, and now your only competition is the 1%, your standards become the 1%. And so now you're acclimating and normalizing to that, which means on a long enough timeline, you will be the 1% if you're operating with the standard of a 1%er. And by standard, I mean the pattern of behavior, the habits, the quality, you are not doing what the other people are doing because your habits, your habits ultimately become your destiny. Your habits become your destiny. This isn't magical thinking or fanciful thinking. This is just reality. It is that, think about it. If your standard of dress becomes the standard of dress of somebody that is in the, that has the job that you want, you're much more likely to be taken seriously in that category. If your speech and mannerisms are of the people that are at the level that you want to be at, you're much likely to be taken more seriously in that way as well. So if you present as that, you will be that on a long enough timeline, on typically, typically speaking. And so that means, think about it. If you looked at how somebody transformed as an athlete, and then you took the same path to that transformation of saying, those standards. This is why, for example, 
When I was in high school and I was a cross country athlete, I didn't use the standards that everyone else was using. Most people were only using the presidential fitness test. When I was a junior in high school, no, actually I started this when I was a freshman and then it had escalated as I was junior. I used, my father was a Marine. So I used the military PT standards for an 18 year old Marine as my athletic standard and said, I will set that standard and I will train until I can pass the military PT test for a 17 year old or 18 year old military recruit. So my standard to train as an athlete was not the high school elite standard, not the standard for a state championship runner. I set it off of the military combat standard of athleticism, which is an extreme, but it's an outlier extreme that nobody else in high school would ever have, which is how I became a championship cross country and track champion, second team all county medalist, and ran an 1818 mile, a 516 mile at peak, and a 1026 two mile, and an 1818 5K in cross country. With very little athletic ability, being smaller and shorter than 80% of the people that I was running against, and having no athletic talent whatsoever. I set a standard of overtraining. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just making a, a literal real world point about the value of ridiculous standards. Ridiculous standards create an outlier advantage when you don't have a natural advantage. You don't have privilege. You don't have anything. You don't have nepotism, right? When you don't have a natural ed edge and you don't have nepotism and you don't come from privilege. Well, what do you do? You set an elite outlier standard that you have to live up to and you train and work until you're capable of executing at that level. And by training and executing at that level, you eventually produce outlier results that are impossible for anybody outside of that. And then the only way they can compensate and the only way that they can compete is if they had an unfair natural advantage, privilege or nepotism working for them, and they will need every ounce of it to compete with the work ethic and standard that you have because it is ridiculous. And if they ever, ever lose that edge, you will always beat them. That's how that would work. So how does this apply in YouTube speak? In YouTube speak, what this means is it's about competing at the standards of a one percenter. Only make thumbnails at the standard of a channel that is 100,000 to a million subscribers in your niche. Do not make thumbnails like a small YouTuber. So what does that mean? That means whatever you have to do to afford to a thumbnail artist, if you don't have the talent to be good at thumbnail shop, at, uh, sorry, at Photoshop, then that means you have to source an artist that is a thumbnail artist for a big YouTuber, pay their rates, whatever it is, and compete for that. And if you have to go out and mow lawns, you have to do some extra babysitting, you have to... Um, sell your video games and pawn them at the pawn shop, whatever it is, you do that. You get this thumbnail artist that gets million view videos to make you 10 thumbnails and you go and you um, freaking compete. You use video ideas. that are outlier video ideas that have 1 million to 10 million views and you figure out how you're going to be a try hard and make a better version of an already successful idea and make it your own without being a copycat by finding a more extreme version you can do of that same video. And you do that until enough people care about you to where they care about your ideas. And so then you're gonna do that. And you're gonna rinse and repeat this and do it a hundred times if that's what it takes, a thousand times if that's what it takes, and then that's how you win. And that's an outlier advantage because no small YouTuber will do it. They will try to do everything with free software, try to do everything without paying somebody, try to do everything, outlier advantage. What James Johnny do when he wanted to blow up? He was like, my first videos, I'm going to make something of a Netflix style that's a 30-minute short of a net, like short form film, docu-film style of a Netflix thing. And he spent his first YouTube video, he spent 200 hours on his first YouTube video. That's how he was an outlier. That's how he won. And then he only made videos if he can put 200 hours into them. He was outworking everybody. That's why it only took him 
30 videos to get a million subscribers because every one of his 30 minute videos had 200 hours behind them and he was able to then generate demand, but he didn't generate out of thin air. He only did it on topics that had broad appeal audiences because he also, in addition to 200 hours of editing, did 50 hours of script writing and did 40 hours of research. And none of you all know that. I, I had the pleasure of working with him on a coaching call around workflow stuff back in the day before he had a million subscribers. None of you all know how hard James Johnny was working when he was a solo content creator, doing everything and putting more effort and more hours into every single aspect. He outworked everyone on every single aspect of video creation and no one else would. There was no competition for James Johnny. He was a one of one. No one will do that. That's the difference. No one will do that. Everyone will take the quick and easy path. They'll do a let's play thing that requires no editing and just post that. They will do, oh, make shorts with my phone and just and do that and everything like that. Do free level green screen, whatever, and everything like that. Hold a $20 microphone up to their mouth. They'll, they'll take the easiest road, the least amount of friction, the lowest common denominator, and there will be nothing non-duplicatable and not special. YouTube is saturated with people who are easily copied, easily duplicatable, and not special. And that sounds arrogant, but I'm not joking. Think about it. So going to extreme lengths, which may not be accessible to you, but I'm not saying this is accessible at all. I'm telling you, I'm not saying this is accessible. That's why it's the 1%. That's why so few people have the success. And a lot of people can't maintain or keep their success or go any further because they plateau and there's not an evolution or there's not a thing or they burn out or they get tired or they get bored. And like that happens. I like got depressed during the pandemic. I cut back uploading by 75% or I'd still be at a status where I was getting uh, 50 to 100 new subscribers a year. But I cut back for four years and did 75% less uploading because I got depressed. The mental health aspect makes it hard to compete. A more fortified mind makes for a more successful YouTuber, more successful entrepreneur, more successful athlete, more successful academic. So the thing is emotional ability, emotional control, mental health. Cold start is a big problem. Starting is a problem. Sustaining is another problem. A lot of people can't do that. So there's all these things you have to do to be an outlier success. And the thing is, it's not luck, believe it or not. It's not luck. It is actually something more important. It is literally your personality, your temperament, and making it right size in your life. And that's not down to luck. That is down to the choices that you make, which are dictated by your temperament, your habits, and your personality. And you can change your personality. Your personality is not down to luck. You can change your personality. You can become a person of discipline. You can become someone who prioritizes their mental health properly and balances it out. You can become someone who develops emotional control. You can be a person of consistency. You can be someone who becomes in, falls in love with the process and the craft. You can make all of those choices. You can choose your personality by making different choices and approaching a different mindset and having and choosing your desires and choosing your sacrifices. You absolutely get to do that. You get to do that. You get to choose who you are. You really do. You get to choose who you are. And there's choices that you would make that would make you much more likely to be successful. And there's choices you can make that make you less likely to be successful. So the thing is, you do have a choice in the matter. And so the thing is, it's saturated with people who want everything but will sacrifice nothing. And we know this. We know this. There's the person who goes and studies their little brains out and knows that they don't have natural talent or natural genius, but they work really hard to be an honor student and get a scholarship because they know that's the only way they're getting out of the neighborhood. Okay? There are people with no natural athletic ability who train and train and train and show up and show up and show up and refine their craft and will not be outworked. And will not be outworked. I love that about what Kobe Bryant used to say. I will not be outworked. Okay? There's people like that. And there are people who will like absolutely like do everything it takes to um, to go out there and win the customer over and win that business and get what it takes to get it done and get the job done. And that will be the successful entrepreneur. That is the person who will knock on a thousand doors when someone else will only knock on 10. 
That is the person who will not stop until they hit their sales goal for the day. That's the person who will not go to bed until they made $1,000 that day. That's an extreme. And that's not sustainable forever. That's not healthy forever. Maybe it's for one year, two years, three years. But the thing is, the people who are willing to do that are the people who win. And they're the minority. And YouTube is not saturated with go-getters like that. YouTube is not saturated with disciplined people who will outwork everyone, will outlearn everyone, outlast everyone. It is not saturated with that mentality. It is saturated with a lot of people who want the whole world and are not willing to give up anything. It is saturated with people who think they know everything and are too good to learn, too good to study, too learn to new learn, too good to learn a new skill every day, to learn too good to spend hours upon hours upon hours refining their craft, even practicing, let alone actually putting something out. Um, YouTube is not saturated with someone who will spend 1,000 hours learning video editing or even 100 hours. YouTube's not saturated with someone who will spend 100 hours learning to edit before they ever put out their first video. YouTube's not saturated with that kind of person. Someone's, YouTube is not saturated with someone who will pay $10 a month for Photoshop, spend 1,000 hours or even 100 hours or even 90 days every day grinding to learn Photoshop. Even in an hour a day, 90 days, someone will not spend 100 hours learning Photoshop and pay $10 a month before they ever make their first thumbnail and ever put out their first video. That is not the mentality of 99.9% .9 of people who say, I want to be a content creator, who say, I want to be a YouTuber. So I don't care how many people make shorts. I don't care how many people make garbage AI generated videos and everything. I don't care because no one is really going to watch them. And even if they do, that person's never going to last. The real YouTuber will outwork 99% of people and will do what 99% of people won't. The real YouTuber will sacrifice for five years and will make 500 videos if that's what it takes, make 1,000 videos if that's what it takes. And the market is not saturated with anyone who's willing to do that. Not across every niche and certainly not in English speaking. Here's the thing. Congrat if you speak English and you live in the United States of America – you're the most privileged YouTuber. You know why? Because you have the laziest group of people competing with you. I will say that. I will beat my chest. If you're an American and you're a YouTuber, congratulations. You won the lottery, damn it. You won the damn lottery because you have the laziest people on earth to compete with if you're an American. If you are an English-speaking American channel, you have the laziest people in the world to compete with on YouTube. They will take every shortcut. They will do anything but work hard at it. So beat them. And I mean that. And I might lose subscribers saying that. I do not care. It is the absolute God honest truth. It is the absolute God honest truth. And with the new um, language m stuff that's coming for YouTube with auto translate, you're going to see it. And you're going to see more people that are international that are going to be able to break into a US market. And you will see a work ethic in this platform like you've never seen and never experienced. And you will know the truth. You will learn the truth because once those people get access to English audiences and American ad dollars and American CPMs, you will see a work ethic unleashed on the globalization of this platform like you've never seen in your life. It will become abundantly clear how much lazy content comes out of this country because everyone will figure out how to do everything but make the best content they possibly can. That's the harsh truth. That's the no filter. That's Roberto going off. That's that's how it is. So like, oh, no, like you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. YouTube is saturated with low hanging fruit and lazy creators. Now, to be fair, it's also saturated with a lot of young people who are just trying their best. It's saturated with a lot of people who don't have resources. It's saturated with a lot of people who don't have any time freedom to work on things. And I have nothing but the utmost respect for them. And I wish them the best. But I also know the reality is there's a lot of people that are just hopers and dreamers, and a lot of them are lazy. Because the people that I'm describing that don't have a lot of time, don't have the resources, a lot of them are going to do the best they can with what they have. And they're going to do the best they can, and you're going to see it because they're going to improve. By 1% every single time that they upload a video, they're going to improve. They're going to start out making 100 crappy videos, and at video 101, they are damn sure going to be better than they were at video 1, video 10, video 20, video 50, and you're going to see it. But there are a lot of people out here that are really lazy and that they will not make 100 videos. They'll get discouraged, and they'll quit at 30.
They are really lazy and they will not try their best to improve one thing every time that they upload. They will not try to learn one new thing every day, let alone every week. They will not spend time learning the tools and learning the craft outside of just editing. They will refuse to make what their audience wants and will just chase their own ego and wondering why and when they will get noticed. There are not enough people who will ever, 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 ever put the audience first. The creators who do that and kill their ego will be the creators that succeed. And they will be rare. And that's why it will likely only be 1% of people. It will be 1% of people because only 1% of people will kill their ego. Only 1% of people will put the audience first. Only 1% of people will figure out, okay, I have to learn how to make money at this so that I can make better content and I can do it more co consistently and I can do it sustainably and not do it at the expense of family. Like there's only 1% of people who will go, okay, that's it. I got to do it. There are only 1% of people who will learn to ask for help. There are only 1% of people that will also say, I want this enough to give up Netflix. I want this enough to give up my other hobbies. I want this enough to, um, you know, wake up an hour earlier. It's only going to be 1% of people. I wish to God it was 10% of people, but it will likely only be one. Because with most outlier things, that is a difference in temperament and personality and psychology. The poor man's passport guide. Thank you for the $10 super chat. You've blown this old man's mind. I'm still learning. Always keep learning. Always, 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 always. Never stop. Doesn't matter how old you get. Doesn't matter how young you are. Keep going. Keep learning. That's what you need to do. And uh, it's okay. By the way, you don't know what you don't know. And it's okay to be a beginner. It's okay to be a beginner. Everyone starts at somewhere. Most people start at zero. Most people start to, most people don't have privilege or they don't recognize the ones that they do have. You're privileged to live in America, but guess what? So are 360 million other people. So that's still important. It's still like a really good privilege, but at the same time, it's a privilege shared by 360 million people. So what's your edge? Find your edge, right? So, okay, I have that. In com I'm like, great, blessed, blah, blah, blah. I have that. In com but so what? 360 million other people have that. Okay, cool. So what's my edge? And the thing is, if you can't find a privilege or a natural advantage, you don't have the benefits of nepotism, then guess what you do have to do? You have to build an edge through hard work as an outlier. You have to make yourself an anomaly by adopting a new pattern of habits that exist outside of other people, that exist outside of other people. And so uh, you have to do what it takes in order to give yourself an unfair advantage and give yourself that edge and it can be done. <clears throat> it can be done. And the thing is you might be in a place by the way, in life that makes you feel lazy. But if you recognize that and dare, you know, you're self-aware you're like, okay. Um, you say, I must admit I'm one of the lazy, easily discouraged ones. I'm working on changing my attitude and a new hunger for knowledge and learning platform. Good for you. Self-awareness and knowing your limitations, and knowing how you're self-sabotaging. If you know how you're self-sabotaging, the first step to solving a problem is acknowledging that it exists. When you can recognize that problem exists, you can now tackle that problem. And the thing is, if you need help, you can ask for it from people, and there will be, some people will say no, some people will say screw you, some people will say figure it out yourself. But the thing is, if you have a willingness and you find helpful people, and you ask for, hey, I'm trying to improve in this thing. What should I do to improve? And you ask enough people that you will get an answer at some point, and then you can test things. <clears throat> you can test things and apply it to yourself. Some things will be for you. Some things won't be for you. You learn what is and isn't for you by trying different things over and over and over until you find where you fit. <clears throat> and a lot of people's problems, they don't try enough things. A lot of people, they don't try enough things. I would encourage you to try more things to, um, you know, to explore yourself, to see, like, what is it that makes sense for you? 
And also to see if YouTube is something you even like and if it's right size in your life. You know, a lot of people, even people who blow up on YouTube, realize that they don't like what it brings into their life. A lot of young people outgrow the brand that they built on YouTube, you know. I've known people who quit 1 million subscribed channels because it was bad for their mental health and they couldn't be happier. Imagine walking away from a million subscribers, but knowing it's the smartest, healthiest, best decision of your life and that it's ruining your life to, to not make that decision sooner. That is something that happens. You can't outgrow this, especially if you're a young person, because what you'll have is an audience that is determined to keep you in a place that you outgrew a long time ago sometimes. So for young people, it's a nice part of their life, but the thing is it can't be forever for some people. That's how it is. That's how it is. Especially the young people that are part of like family vlogs, a lot of them, the channel has to stop because the kids grow up and now they have a choice of whether they want to participate and they're like, no, I want to live my life in peace and in private now. So a lot of, young, a lot of family channels have to stop because the kids outgrow the channel and people watch for the kids, not for the parents. And they outgrow the channel. And so million subs, two million subs, whatever it is, oh, that's gone because the kid wants to live their life, wants to go to high school, wants to go to college without having to be uh, overshadowed in their life by the content. That happened. It's a real thing. I've known people like that. I've talked to people like that. I've known the parents. I've known some of the young people involved. Like That's something that you have to understand is that you have to make YouTube right size in your life. You absolutely have to make um, – YouTube right size in your life. Uh, last question. Do you suggest uh, live streams list as podcast on YouTube? I think it can be great for a lot of channels. Uh, it's not for everybody. But I, I think that uh, for a lot of channels that doing the podcast is um, a really good idea. So, yeah. But that's it, everybody, for tonight's live stream. It's super late. I need to go to bed. I need to wake up early in the morning. I actually only meant to stream for two hours. It is now four hours. I think we covered most of what I wanted to talk about. We will do another one on brand deals. And like I said, we do have a variety of streams planned in the future. Next live stream is going to be, um, I believe, this Wednesday. Um, uh, what's on the schedule for this Wednesday? Um Let's see. It looks like the Wednesday live stream is going to be a uh, free workshop on how to sell digital products online as a content creator. So look forward to that. That one's going to be sponsored by good friends at Kajabi. I want to thank all of our brand partners and sponsors. StreamYard, this is what's laying a stream on multiple channels right now. Opus Clip for repurposing our uh, shorts content across multiple platforms. Definitely check them out. Links for everybody in the description down below. Kajabi, which I use for my coaching and for Awesome Creator Academy, my membership group. You can join the Awesome Creator Academy Pro group. Sign up. We do two uh, live office hours a week. We do that with Kajabi. If you want to do online courses, community, cohorts, one-on-one -on -one coaching, sign up for Kajabi. All in one business in a box. Opus Clip for your repurposing, StreamYard for your live streaming and webinars. Couldn't make streaming easier if we tried other than using StreamYard. And yeah, we'll be back for a Wednesday workshop on selling digital products. That's going to make a lot of you some money if you have the right market fit for that. Uh, so we're going to try that. So that's Workshop Wednesdays. We'll be back Friday as well with a uh, FAQ Friday on how to grow your audience as a content creator in 2024. We'll be reviewing YouTube analytics and teaching you some content strategy. Uh, so we've got that coming up. Um, thank you. It looks like across all of the platforms, we have 693 live viewers across all of our platforms. I know that's not how many might be watching on YouTube, but that is all of the combined uh, platforms. So that is really dope, and I appreciate y'all. Uh, I'm not sure where all of them are coming from between YouTube. We have x.com. We have Facebook. We have LinkedIn Live. We have uh, Twitch. We have kick.com. I don't think we're on Instagram right now. I'm going to figure that out. But I really do appreciate all of you um, tuning in. Um, it's a, a tight schedule. Some of you got the alerts. Uh, some of you unsubscribed from the alerts. But definitely appreciate you guys. Appreciate our mods and all of our um donations appreciate you doug Houston, for moderating as always um 
we'll add some more of you to the mod squad. Uh, but yeah, absolutely appreciate you. Um, links for everything are in the description down below. And we're going to end the stream with the trailer for my book. So stay awesome. And we'll catch you on the next live stream, which is Wednesday. If we don't catch you Wednesday, we'll catch you for FAQ Fridays if you're not on Workshop Wednesdays. Monetization Mondays, Workshop Wednesdays, FAQ Fridays. That's the schedule, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, unless otherwise uh, specified. I will try to be on time for you. Anyway, stay awesome and check out my book trailer. Link to my book is in the description down below. It's also on Amazon. Uh, create something awesome. How creators are profiting from their passion in the creator economy. It's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, all the places. Stay awesome, you guys. I'll catch you next time. I finally did it. I finished my book, Create Something Awesome, How Content Creators Are Profiting From Their Passion in the Creator Economy. The book is available now in paperback and in Kindle, where you can read it on any e-reader or device. And I'm really excited about this. The audiobook is coming soon, probably October 2022. Oh my God, it's so great to be able to have this book done put it up on the bookshelf and to know that all of you who appreciate it, you want to hear what I have to say about the creator economy, becoming a full-time content creator and what the experience and lifestyle of being a content creator actually is like. Uh, this is the book. I, I put 20 chapters in here of the most important things I think that content creators could be focusing on today. I talk about the mental health aspect of being a content creator, uh, getting discouraged, imposter syndrome, not charging what you're worth, and mostly actionable advice around monetizing your content properly, but also how to build an audience on your authenticity and what it's really like to start from zero, even today. So if you're interested, make sure you're checking out the book. You can order it on Amazon. You also probably order it in a lot of other places like Barnes and Noble, and it will be coming to other bookstores soon. Really excited about it. Thank you for all the support and love around the book and the positive reviews. Now go ahead and pick it up and make sure you go out there and create something awesome today. Take care.